Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councilman Suarez is running late, so I'm going to be uh, introducing uh, you for him, ma'am. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the Reverend Jacqueline Coffey Leakes, who is a Tampa native and graduated from Hillsborough High School and attended the University of Florida and re received her bachelor's degree from Moody Bible Institute. She is the mother of three beautiful children, Tia, Eric, and Keandra, and is the daughter of the late 
R Ronald Coffey Sr. and Marilyn Streeter. She is a member of the 34th Street Church of God, where Bishop uh, Tom Scott and our former uh, colleague here on Tampa City Council is the pastor. Uh, she serves in our community in several capacities, including being a part of the mayor's African American Advisory Council, the vice chair of the Sulphur Springs Neighborhood of Promise, and a member of the Tampa Metro Alumni uh, Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta uh, incorporated. So, uh, Reverend, it's our real pleasure to have you here. If everyone would please stand for the prayer and remain standing for the pledge. Thank you. Honored to be here. Let us pray. Lord, first we say thank you for this day, realizing that because you promised that you would care for us, you brought us to this very moment. As I stand before your people, I'm humbled as your servant. I thank you, God, for this city council. I thank you for this city. God, I ask God that as they work daily to transform our community, that you continue to transform, transform them. God, those things that are causing them to be frustrated, allow it to make them more focused. Those things, God, that are causing discord, we right now agree for harmony. God, we pray right now for our law enforcement and our fire department and all the areas that serve our city. God, as they put out the fires, help them not to just put out the fires, but to calm the fear of the people. As they enforce the laws, God, help them to embrace the people with a sense of community. We thank you for what this city stands for. We thank you for the covering over this city. But most of all, God, we stand today to ask you to continue to unite us to serve your people. Don't let us look down unless we're going to pick someone up. Remind us that their vote is more than a vote, but it's a voice. So as they make decisions today, let them be reminded of what you called them to do to serve our city. We thank you. We ask that you bless us individually and collectively. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Roll call. Suarez. Colin. Maniscalco. Here. Capine. Present. Miranda. Here. Vieira. Here. Reddick. Here. All right, we go to ceremony activities, and the first item on the agenda is the police officer of the month. I yield to Mr. Charlie Miranda. Thank you, Honorable Chairman of Tampa City Council, on Honorable Council Members. My pleasure this morning to be here for the council to make the presentation to Detective Michael McNamara. Went into here what he's done on a computer and how he handles the collection and information that is needed to make uh, these arrests. Uh, Chief Asquith would make the presentation, and uh, Michael, right here, sir, right here. We have to frisk you, make sure you don't have a computer on you. <laughs> but uh, th this is uh, an individual who's worked so diligently, and like I said, Chief Asquith is going to say exactly what he's done and, and why he was chosen of one of 12 a year as police officer of the month when there's over 1,000 police officers. So that means that he knows what he's doing. That means that he's been above the call of duty, and he does it uh, because of not only his job, but the will to serve the public. Good morning, Council. Assistant Chief Eli Vasquez, pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule to um, recognize one of our uh, best and brightest officers here. Um, I have with me Detective McNamara, who is an eight-year veteran. He's been uh, with the Violent Crime Bureau for two years, and he puts together some really great cases, and this will be, um, what I read here, will be one of them. Um, one of his many duties is to um, monitor social media for many of these violent uh, offenders and what they post and, uh, and any intelligence we can uh, get from that and we follow up on that. So in this particular case, uh, Detective McNamara observed a live story video posted into Instagram account of a known uh, offender at a gun range firing several uh, different firearms. This offender was just released from prison uh, and is a convicted felon. <clears throat> Detective McNamara was able to determine that the gun range he was at uh, was in Plant City. 
And obviously we don't have any jurisdiction there. So what he did is he got with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement um, to assist him in this investigation. So he responded out to the gun range and was able to recover the shell casings that were still there. Uh, through his investigation, he was able to determine that two other convicted felons were also shooting at this range. Both of these subjects were also just released from prison uh, for firearms offenses. He also learned that the group rented three firearms and brought two of their own guns to the range to practice with, uh, one being a FN 9mm handgun. So he called the forensics unit out there. They responded out there, uh, collected numerous shell casings and other evidence as well. A latent print from one of the rented rifles was recovered uh, that belonged to one of these offenders. And another print was on a, an ammunition box uh, that they had touched. A day after this investigation started, a 17-year-old boy riding his bike at the area of 20th Street in Fairbanks, just minding his own business, uh, when a vehicle drove by and fired three shots at this juvenile. The juvenile was struck and is now paralyzed. The shell casings recovered in that particular case were entered into the NIBIN system, which is the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network, and found to match the casings recovered from the Plant City gun range and the FN 9mm taken from one of the offenders. Further investigation revealed incriminating statements by the offenders. Detective McNamara wrote a search warrant on the cell phone and Instagram accounts of these offenders, which provided more evidence that linked them to that particular shooting. In December, he was able to charge two of the offenders with attempted murder for that shooting of the juvenile, and the other offender was charged with felon in possession. This investigation also led to two other shooting investigations that we're currently investigating, still ongoing. And it's because of this type of work that Detective McNamara has done over the years, the last several years in the Violent Crime Bureau. Uh, his hard work, dedication uh, to the violent uh, crime fight, that we uh, um, recognize him as our officer of the month for the month of January. So we're very proud of him. I know his parents are here, uh, retired Major uh, uh, George McNamara is back there. And his uh, mom is retired as well. She's a lieutenant. She's uh, Jerry Falsetto. And I'm sure they're very proud of him. We are as well. Thank you very much. Good morning, Council. Abe Carmack, President of the Tampa PBA. Um, first and foremost, thank you for what you do every, every day and to continue this and to recognize members uh, of the organization of the department. We appreciate that, Chief. Thank you for recognizing a member in, in the chain of command um, for, for recommending them. I've had the pleasure. Um, when, when I was out in training that when Mike started, um, I was out there and, and I knew firsthand that he was going to do great things. And this isn't his first time standing before council receiving this award. This is actually his second time. And I'm sure that this won't be the last. Um, we're very proud of what he's done. He makes us you know, shine just like every other officer that stands up here every month. And we appreciate what you do for that. We'd like to uh, present you with a watch um, for, your, for our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We'd also like to give a shout out to our counterparts of the fire, the, uh, the firefighter of the quarter. Thank you, guys. You know, we appreciate all that you do. Thank you. Good morning, Council. Mike MacArthur with Steps Towing Service. Congratulations, Detective, and job well done. Thank you. As a resident of Plant City, I'm sure I speak for everybody in our small town and said thank you. Uh, so we, you know, we, we look for everything that everything you guys can do for us and, and just every, and our community as a whole. So we appreciate that. Um, on behalf of Todd Stepp, Steps Towing Service, I'd like to present you with a $50 Bass Pro gift card. Thank you. And a night out in our company limousine for you and your family. Enjoy your night. Take some time off. You deserve it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Council. Tom Rowe in Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Detective. The Buccaneers would like to recognize you and your honor being bestowed today with a game football. The inscription reads, thank you for your dedication and service to our community, January 31st, 2019, Officer of the Month. Congratulations. Good morning. My name is Mary Lou Bailey. I'm here on behalf of Zoo Tampa at Lowry Park. Thank you for your service. It's awesome. 
Um, I learned in the Citizens Police Academy how focused uh, the police are and how you guys have been so great at reducing crime rate, and it's the kind of research and diligence you showed that really exemplifies the whole thing. I'm presenting you with an um, annual pass to Zoo Tampa. It's for you and your family, and I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you um, enjoy nature and wildlife as much as I do. And also, you can go to the special events for free, like at Christmas and Halloween and stuff. So enjoy it. Thank Congratulations. You. Good morning, Council. Jim Carson, Bill Curry Ford. We see, congratulations. Thanks. We see many of you officers come through our dealership. You rose to the top. And when, also, when I was doing this little die cast car I'm going to give you, I noticed your badge number was number five. Yes, sir. And I found out the history of it, so you have to be honored to have your dad's number. Yes, so sir. on behalf of Bill Curry, family, and myself, we have a Mustang for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Morning, George Rodriguez from MNR Therapy. How you doing, man? Thank you, man. Uh, we just wanted to present you a certificate for a free therapy session, massage. Anything that hurts, I know it's probably just crazy out there running around and chasing guys. So, anything you need from us, give us a call and we'll take care of it. Yes, sir. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Good morning, Council. Uh, Pete Brevy, Bush Gardens, Tampa Bay. Uh, first of all, thank you for your continued support and allowing us to participate in this obviously worthwhile event. It happens uh, multiple times a year. And, uh, like uh, Councilmember Miranda stated, there's only 12 to get the honor. I'm um, having the pleasure to know your parents. You come from great genetics. He's a great cop, and above all, he's a great human being and a great man. On behalf of Bush Gardens, I'd like to present you with four tickets to our theme park. And if you need more, I see you got a screaming family back there and whatever. <laughs> Feel free to reach out and take care of you. Thank you. Tampa Theater Detective, thank you so much for your hard work and your service in our community on behalf of Tampa Theater. I'm happy to give you the gift of a membership so you can come and see us on Franklin Street. Thank you thank so you. much. Congratulations. Thank you. Good morning, Council. Brian Ramirez with the Tampa Expressway. Congratulations, Joe. Thank you for your service. Um, gift bag we put together and a $20 gift certificate to Bait and Tackle. Perfect. Congratulations, John. Thank you. Thank you. I come here. <laughs> morning. How you doing? Good morning. For you. you know, the traffic is really backed up down there. <laughs> it is pretty bad. Anyway, I'm here on behalf of a couple different uh, clients. Uh, one of them is CRG Restaurants. They're going to provide you with a gift certificate for $50. Another is um, <coughs> Yummy House uh, China Bistro, $50 from them. Another is from the Prestige Portraits. They're going to provide you with a portrait package for you and your family and uh, a gift certificate from the YMCA. Thank you. Yeah, bless you. On behalf of Tampa City Council, we're deeply honored that uh, you're wearing your father's number, number five, and we're very appreciative of what you've done and your continued service, uh, not only to the community, to be a wonderful young man, and the chief, what he said is uh, unbelievable what you've done and the way you put it together. You're a true uh, spirit man individual that really believes this community is safer because of what you do and what all the police officers do in, in this city. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's an honor to be recognized. Um, I do want to point out a couple of things about this case that they referenced. Uh, first, there is a kid that has got a long road ahead of him here, still trying to recover a victim in the case. And second to that, uh, that's, that's mine. <laughs> um, I didn't make this case by myself. It took a lot of hard work from a lot of people to put this case together. I appreciate being recognized for it, but I didn't know where this gun range even was. Officer DeBush, Officer Gustafson, Officer Simpkins did. They're the one that pointed me in that direction. When I got there, I didn't have jurisdiction. If Sergeant Moss didn't call FDLE, I can't make this case. When I get out there, I'm overwhelmed by the amount of evidence I have. 
Alicia Kaufman's the crime scene technician that drove all the way out to Plant City in five o'clock traffic and collected so much evidence it took two and a half days to process. From there, our fingerprint specialist, Thomas Gonzalez, he had to spend, I don't know how many hours looking at literally hundreds of fingerprints for this case. Dennis Rodriguez works with our Niven technician on my squad. He worked with FDLE to make sure the comparisons matched up for the ballistics in this case so that we could make the case. And then the sheriff's office ends up reaching out and they provided a critical witness in the case. So it was a collaborative effort with a lot of different people that led to this case going the way that it did. So I'm thankful to be honored here today, but it took a lot more to me to make this case. Thank you. I just wanted to salute and commend you for your work. And did I hear that both your parents are police officers or? They're both retired police officers. Retired, that's great. Well, that's, and, and were their parents at all police officers or? No, sir. Okay, so second generation, but just thank you for all that you do. Um, you know, police officers have to uh, see us, uh, society at, at our worst, and then you've got to act your best. And that's a really tough challenge, and you really seem like the kind of person who pulls that off. So just thank you for all your work. We're really in your debt. I mean that. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, Honorable Chairman, Honorable Members of Tampa City Council, my pleasure today with Chief Cicero to make the presentation to the firefighter of the quarter. This individual has done some outstanding things that the Chief will bring up when he comes to the mic in a second. And uh, this individual is just one of many in the fire department that, that's created once a quarter. So how many quarters are there in a year? That's the odds that he has of getting this. So it's in, well, when do you see what he's done? And when do you see how he did it? And when do you see what, he, what it means to the community? Because this one officer took one step to say, I want to make a little change. Chief? Appreciate that. Good morning, Honorable Chair and Council. Uh, thank you for this opportunity today. We come before you today to recognize Captain Ernest McKee as he's been selected as firefighter of the quarter for 2019. Uh, Captain McKee has been with the department for over 14 years. Uh, he was originally assigned to West Tampa at Station 9 for four years before transferring to Station 6, which is in the port. There, his love for the fire service and his dedication to duty led him to be a specialist on the hazardous materials team, which led him to seek out uh, much specified training in relating to uh, protection of the port and the community therein. He was promoted to driver in 2011, and he was assigned, uh, again, continuing uh, his uh, hazmat routes. Uh, he continued his courses with radio, uh, radiological and nuclear site surveying in Nevada, uh, advanced biological chemical incidents training in Utah, and rail car uh, incidents uh, with classes out in Colorado. So he is well versed and has done a lot to uh, make this community safe. Uh, overall, he spent uh, seven and a half years uh, within the hazmat division and, and uh, because of his duty and his focus, uh, in 2018 he was promoted to captain. With that assignment, he was assigned to uh, Station 8 in the West Shore District. Not a bad place to go, my first assignment. It's a very good area to work in, uh, where he's been uh, thus far. In the past year, he's uh, distinguished himself as a, uh, an outstanding captain. He has a humble and uh, deliberate uh, mannerism about him. Uh, and after all of that, he realized that uh, one of the things that's prevalent with that area is you, you, you do go and respond on a whole host of automobile accidents in that area. Uh, the traffic has changed dramatically uh, over time. And uh, recently, we just had a chance to uh, talk, and he was surprised. Uh, at how much traffic and population and, and uh, building structure has changed in that district. With all that being said, uh, one uh, night in particular, he was assigned with his engine company to a motor vehicle accident, which was a, uh, a longer protracted extrication. And while they put their uh, duties and skills to good use and they were able to extract the person from the car, one of the things that they really noticed and over time, uh, car manufacturing and uh, the manners in which 
uh, the steels are put together in these vehicles has changed. And uh, sometimes we are not, and the fire service is uh, in tuned uh, with those changes uh, in, in how far we go to stay in line with those. So he was able to successfully extricate the person from the car, and if you're ever unfortunate enough to be there, uh, you can't get out of it too soon, obviously. What he did with that incident was uh, to take that to, uh, uh, to another level. And he sought out through the administration and, uh, and much work on his own to seek out uh, uh, a separate funding source uh, and to seek out some grants for some improved extrication equipment that would be on that unit because it goes to so many uh, extrications. So uh, through the auspices of firehouse subs, he was able to uh, obtain a grant for fire extrication equipment that was uh, really suitable for that engine company. Uh, they received uh, uh, a whole suit of uh, extrication equipment, uh, close to $30,000 worth of extrication equipment that would, that would be of tremendous value to that community and, and the West Shore area. You know, the allegiance that he has shown uh, and the uh, honor to the department really should be recognized and that's why we're here today. Throughout his career, he has, uh, he has proven himself uh, again and again. Uh, he has stood out by receiving two Esprit de Corps awards, uh, high-rise training certification and a marine certification working with the fireboats. And, and uh, all that, he still has time for community service as he has uh, continually uh, uh, worked in several paint your heart outs uh, that the city provides. So for his commitment and dedication, uh, assuring uh, fire rescue is better equipped and uh, trained to serve the citizens that, uh, that we ultimately serve, we're proud to recognize Captain Ernest McKee as our firefighter of the quarter. Good morning, Council. Captain Orrin Hansen, uh, Chairman of the Tampa Fire Rescue Awards Review Board. On behalf of the board, I would like to congratulate Captain McKee for being selected as the first quarter firefighter of the quarter. And on behalf of Texas Day Brazil, a night out. You also have a weekend stay from the Marriott that will be coming for the night of our event, the weekend of that. Uh, it's in the mail. I'll have it to you. Congratulations. <laughs> Good morning, Council. Joe Greco from Tampa Firefighters Local 754. We'd also like to congratulate uh, Captain McKee. This is his plaque for uh, Firefighter of the Quarter. And here's a $50 gift card. Thank you. Thank you Appreciate very much. Right. Good morning, Council. Mike MacArthur, Steps Towing Service Captain. Congratulations Thanks, on the job. Well done. Appreciate it. This is amazing. I mean, every quarter we come in here and to support the Brotherhood just amazing that the work that you guys do for our community and we can't thank you enough. We're so glad to be a part of everything you guys do. So on behalf of Todd Steph, Steph's Towing Service, we'd like to present you with a $50 Bass Pro gift card and a night out in our company limousine for you and your family. Enjoy it, take some time off. Thank you, right. appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning, Council. We have a name with Temp Theater. Captain, thank you so much for your work in our community. We're very lucky to have you. This is a gift membership. Uh, on behalf of Temp Theater, I'm really happy to give you this gift so you can come and visit us on Franklin Street. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good morning, Council. Jim Carson, Bill Curry Ford. On behalf of the Curry family and myself, I'd like to present you a brand new Mustang. <laughs> Morning, Council. Tom Rowe in Tampa Bay Buccaneers. <laughs> Captain, congratulations. Thank you, I'd like to recognize your accomplishment for the game ball reading. Uh, <laughs> thank you for your dedication and service to our community. January 31st, Firefighter of the Quarter. Thank you. Congratulations. Appreciate it. <laughs> Morning, Council. George Rodriguez with MNR Therapy Center. Thank you, man, for everything. Uh, we just wanted to give you a certificate for a massage therapy session come in and let us know what's going on, what hurts. I know you guys have a tough job, so set something up and come by, man. We'll take care of you. Thank All right? You. Thank you, it. man. Good morning, Council. Again, Pete Brevy, Bush Gardens. Captain, thank you for all you do. It's, uh, like Mike said, it's just incredible the, uh, every quarter the support that the fire department gets here. I think it's an incredible display, and obviously it's a testament to you as a man. Thank you for what you do, and on the personal <coughs> selfish note, I live in the West Shore District, uh, District so thank you. Right. I hope I never get to meet you. Exactly. Um, but on behalf of Bush Gardens, I'm going to give you four tickets to uh, 
Come enjoy one of our parks anytime you want. And if you need more tickets, just holler. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy yourself. Thank you. Council Brian Ramirez, Tampa Expressway. Captain, congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you for your service. Thank you for everything that you do. Um, put a goodie bag together for you and the $20 gift certificate. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Appreciate it. Good morning, Mary Lou Bailey here on behalf of Zoo Tampa at Lowry Park. Congratulations and thank you so much for all of your service and for all of your support here and all the great work you all do. And I appreciate the initiative you took to improve the process and the technology and the tools. That's awesome. You. Enjoy yourself uh, all year long at Zoo Tampa. That's a family membership and it also comes with a special event. And check out some of our behind the scenes tours. You can like feed a rhino or pet an Aldabra tortoise. It's really awesome. Okay. Enjoy yourself. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. How are you? Congratulations. Thank you. Um, Steve McElhaney. First, let me just say that uh, a few years ago we had an extrication rodeo. Uh, where we invited, uh, the, actually uh, Tampa Fire Rescue invited area fire departments to compete uh, with other fire departments uh, in, within the Tampa Bay region. And um, your, your dedication has, has sort of uh, inspired me to go and ask to see if we can't reinstitute that, that rodeo to help uh, improve the skills of the, the folks who are out there. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Um, on behalf of the uh, Chicho's Restaurant Group, uh, we're going to provide you with a $50 gift certificate. On behalf of the Emmy House uh, China Bistro, $50 gift certificate. Prestige Portraits, uh, a family portrait, and a uh, gift certificate to the YMCA. Uh, thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Chief, uh, Chief LoCicero and Tampa City Council and all the citizens of the city of Tampa are very grateful for what you've done, are doing, and will continue to do. We're very appreciative of everything that was said about you, and here's your accommodation, uh, Captain McKee. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Wow. <laughs> totally uh, didn't expect that. but. Uh, I did write a few things down, so don't worry. It, uh, it'll be short. I just don't trust myself. So. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank, uh, acknowledge a few people. Uh, the Mayor Buckhorn, who uh, I don't see here, but I'd like to thank him. Uh, city Council members, thank you for your time <clears throat> and allowing this recognition award to be heard here today. Uh, thank you to Chief LoCicero and the executive staff for your guidance and leadership of the department. Um, thank you to all the sponsors. Uh, completely unexpected, the generosity. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you to my crew uh, for the support that they've given me from day one. In particular, my driver engineer, David Harris, who uh, he got this ball rolling for my recognition here today. So, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank my family members <clears throat> for their continual love and support. My mother and stepfather, Joe and Linda. Uh, my three sons, Zach, Kyle, and Ben. I'm very proud of all three of you guys. And last but not least, my beautiful wife, Vicki. Love you. <laughs> thank you for everything you do. Uh, in closing, I'd just like to say that this fire department is full of men and women that do so many great things, both on duty and their own time. And for me to be recognized by my peers as one of those people is very humbling and appreciated. So I proudly accept this award. Yeah. Thank you.
Vaughn's got the number. Frank's got the number. We go to item number three. Uh, got a accommodation being presented by uh, Councilman uh, Maniscalco. So today I have with me uh, Greg and Michelle Baker. Um, for those of you who have frequented uh, the refinery in Seminole Heights, uh, I call them pioneers uh, in that historic neighborhood because uh, back in 2010 or so, they opened um, and really uh, changed the whole scene up there um, in, uh, in, the, in, in the restaurant uh, business. Uh, I call Seminole Heights a district of culinary art because there's food that you can get up in that area that you can't find anywhere else in Tampa. And people know that because there are so many folks that come from out of town to visit these locations. They've won uh, numerous awards, uh, have been acknowledged, uh, finalists for the James Beard Award, which is huge for those of you that know, I call it like the, uh, the Oscars of the, uh, of the restaurant business. So uh, it's a big deal. And they brought a lot of positive attention to the city and to the neighborhood. And um, Mr. Baker will soon be retiring. And uh, we wanna give them, uh, he and Michelle, this uh, commendation for uh, their many years of hard work uh, to improve uh, this area and really put uh, Seminole Heights in a positive spotlight. So the Tampa City Council recognizes and bestows this commendation of Michelle and Greg Baker for their outstanding culinary contributions and dedication to our community. The Bakers opened the refinery in 2010 in historic Seminole Heights and through their pioneering spirits changed the culinary landscape of the city. Not only have the Bakers upped the dining experience game in Tampa, they are also known for resurrecting nearly lost Florida ingredients and cooking techniques and are avid defenders of farm worker rights and policy reform. Greg and Michelle, we are immensely proud of all you've accomplished. We know that while this is the end of a chapter, this is definitely not the end of a book. We look forward to seeing what you have in store for our community in the future. You have been and continue to be invaluable leaders in our community and assets to the city of Tampa. Therefore, it is our honor to present you with this commendation on the 31st day of January, 2019. There you go. There's a man in um, yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, I'm not exactly the most eloquent person in the world, so I'll just, I just want to say um, thank you, uh, Council. Thank you, uh, Councilman Maniscalco. Um, it's a great honor to be recognized and um, you know, hope for more opportunities to be able to uh, serve the community in the future. So. Sure. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have the Florida Department of Transportation here to speak on the status of Bush Boulevard, and we thank you guys for being here today. Good morning, my name is uh, Brian Schroer with the Florida Department of Transportation, the Planning and Environmental Office. I'm here to present uh, some information on the uh, West Bush Boulevard corridor study that has uh, been taking place the past uh, almost two years now. Um, I'm not sure how we go to the next slides. How do we, is there a clicker that we use for the next or something? Sorry. 
Never been here before, so. All right. So I, I'd like to acknowledge uh, a lot of stakeholders and people who are part of the, uh, the uh, advisory groups that we put together to discuss the issues along the corridor. Uh, Councilman uh, Vieira was, this, it was assisting us. We had uh, City of Tampa, Plan Hillsboro, Hillsborough <coughs> County, Bush Gardens, Hillsborough uh, County School Boards, which included the transportation offices and the principals who had also helped out. Uh, fire, Rescue, and Heart, and we had some other Sierra Club members, Innovation Alliance, and the Black Tampa Black Chamber of Commerce that was included in our membership. A little bit about the West Bush Boulevard. We were looking at 3.3 miles along Bush Boulevard from Dale Mabry over to Nebraska Avenue. Uh, it, it's both within the city of uh, Tampa and unincorporated Hillsborough County. Within the corridor study, we also had a resurfacing project that was in between Armenia and uh, Florida Avenue. And that resurfacing project was going on design at the same time the study was happening. It, the resurfacing was going to take a look at uh, existing issues and uh, uh, safety issues out there, as well as resurfacing the pavement. <coughs> so what we did during the, uh, the study we had an innovative uh, project here because it was not only just a corridor study, it involved a 3R resurfacing project, and after the study was completed, it involved another design that was urban corridor improvement designs that would take what happened and we found out during the study and create another design that we'd move towards construction. We used some uh, different type of public outreach. Uh, we used some innovation like uh, the project websites, some social media, we had a uh, web map that would allow users to go in and leave comments at specific locations, and it helped out immensely. Uh, we created workshops and public uh, project advisory groups that provided information from the stakeholders and residents in the area about the issues on the roadway and what they would like to see happen to the road. Uh, these helped create the alternatives that were developed as part of the study and move into design. Um, we had a lot of issues out there with safety and, and that was what really came out with uh, the public involvement. So we tried to push the changes that we're looking at doing out there, um, trying to make sh this a different type of roadway, address a lot of the issues since there are so many schools and pedestrians out there. Excuse me. Uh, so we started with a field review. We went out and walked the corridor from end to end, looked at the issues, and what we mainly saw was uh, the section between Armenia and Florida had some sidewalk gaps out there, which has been raised in several other projects. Um, so we looked at the sidewalk gap issues. We saw there was no bike lanes along the whole corridor length, and there was no mid-block crossings for uh, the amount of uh, pedestrian and bike traffic out there and, and long distances in between. So. We took that, and we also looked at the crash data along the corridor. It's heavily traveled. It's a major east-west corridor that we, is being used for a lot of uh, commuters. Uh, as you see in the, the graphic here, the, the high crash locations tend to be at the major intersections of Dale Mabry, North Dale, Armenia, and Florida, or North Boulevard, not North Dale. Uh, Bush Boulevard is number four on the NPO's top severe Orders, and they recently did a uh, school safety study and Chamberlain was the number one location of uh, issues of safety they found out there. The, uh, the corridor has three bus routes out running along the corridor, uh, 15 stops at, uh, at showing along the corridor also. So that adds a lot of uh, pedestrian traffic into there. A lot of the major pedestrian movements are north-south across the corridor at, at North Boulevard where the schools are located. Uh, so we had a lot of uh, issues with pedestrian activities and wanted to really address those. Bicycle traffic was the same. A lot of schools, uh, uh, students are riding the bikes to the school. So we looked at that information too and see how we could address this. There's no bike lanes. What features do we need to add out there? Come on. All right. 
as I said, uh, the feedback that we got from the public and the stakeholders in the project advisory group we had was safety was the number one issue, uh, along with multimodal access. And they wanted to see what changes could be enacted out there. So we've taken that along with the wiki mapping to find out where these exact locations are having issues. And we tried to formulate some alternatives that will address the issues in the short term and also what needed to be de done in long term to address traffic congestion out there. So right now, prior to even getting the resurfacing project out, uh, our traffic operations office has already enacted some work out there. They've taken uh, the signal at North Boulevard and Bush, where the Chamberlain High School is and Adams Middle up further up the road. Uh, they've changed the signal timing to add a protected left turn lane for the northbound and southbound drivers. They extended the walk time for the crossing for the pedestrians at the school. And that's associated with the in, uh, letting in and letting out of the schools also. Uh, speed education enforcement incentive where we're going to contract with uh, law enforcement to be out there a little bit more present to uh, enforce the speed out there. Uh, that will be coming sometime in March we're looking at. Uh, speed feedback signs have already been placed out there uh, either side of Armenia Avenue about 425 feet either side east to west. Uh, those will uh, let the drivers know what speed they're going if they tend to go over the speed limit or start telling them to slow down too. It helps to identify and bring it to the people to notice that they're speeding. Uh, the lighting has been upgraded at North Boulevard also. It's been upgraded from uh, mercury vapor, sodium vapor up to LED which is a lot brighter light out there. And we're also looking at continuing other locations along Bush Boulevard with the lighting. And also with the schools, the, they're having some educational training out there. Uh, recently, January 15th, the Teen Safe Driving Program was there and talking with the students at the school. And there'll be other opportunities where they'll be presenting information to the students to help them with crossing the roadway and pedestrian walking and biking and driving because they're getting to that age. So those are the things that are being enacted right now. Uh, what we're also doing is the 3R project that will be starting construction in late spring. Uh, they said they're going to address resurfacing and some safety issues that are going to be needed now. We have a second design that is being scoped right now. It's going to take the alternatives from the corridor study and we're looking at how to really enact that design to meet all the needs of uh, the issues that are brought up during the study. That design is funded. Like I said, we're scoping it now. Construction is not funded. Once we have a good concept of what the construction project will be, then we can look at funding for that. Um, that project that I was just talking about will be from Dale, Dale Mabry to Nebraska Avenue, and that's number 10 on the uh, MPO priority list right now. Other projects that are happening at the same time, Armenia intersection at Bush is being uh, redone, and that's a city of Tampa job. Uh, Florida Avenue has some rail safety improvements and um, some dual left turns are being looked at um, to access northbound and southbound I-275. So they're adding one additional left turn lanes at each one of those ramps. So that's in a future we're waiting on funding issues with that one. And Innovation has, uh, Alliance has some Innovation Gateway projects that they're looking at doing underneath 275. I'm a little behind here. <laughs> so this uh, new design that I'll be starting from Dale Mabry to Nebraska is an urban corridor improvement project. Uh, like I said, we saw during our field reviews there was sidewalk gaps. So we're looking at acquiring a right away to uh, fill in those sidewalk gaps. Uh, the five lane section from Armenia to North Boulevard, we're looking at changing those median accesses to add median islands. Uh, we had a lot of issues with people traveling the lane instead of using it as a turn lane. Uh, we were looking at uh, proposing a signalized crosswalk at North Rome Circle. Uh, there's a lot of pedestrian activity and that would help break up the road uh, that's a long length of uh, crossing uh, that would be needed. Um, we had issues at North Ola so we were looking at uh, maybe making right, right in and right out at North Ola and putting a median island to separate no left turns as you head eastbound on uh, Bush Boulevard. 
Some additional things that were brought up during the study is uh, there's a sidewalk gap missing by the library at North Boulevard as it goes over the tracks heading north. We will work with the city to uh, possibly joint uh, add that into the next construction project that could address that. Further along West uh, Bush, underneath and west of Del Mabry, there's a sidewalk gap, so we would talk with the county on uh, incorporating that into another project. And some of the work to do uh, signal interconnect to help manage speed along the corridor and um, help platoon the people so they aren't racing to the next light and then end up stopping and adding a lot more congestion. What I have here now is a, some examples. The, the roadway corridor is broken up into four sections. So Del Maybe to Armenia Avenue. At the top, you can see an existing typical section. We have the CSX track on the south side of the roadway. And the bottom graphic is a proposed uh, typical section. Uh, it addresses the issues that we have found out there and uh, helps with uh, speed management. We're looking at reducing lane widths out there adding medians to help with uh, uh, the left turns that are in some of the, the developments that are happening. Uh, White Trout Lake is a new apartment complex that's coming in. So we're looking at uh, helping with that. Uh, the next section, North Armenia to North Boulevard, is the five lane section I was talking about. It has the sidewalk gaps on the south side. Um, we're looking to acquire right away to fill those. Um, if we can get that, we have proposed filling in the sidewalk, changing the two-way left turn lane to median islands to address some uh, people traveling instead of using it as a turn lane. And again, narrowing lanes for uh, speed management practices. The third section is North Boulevard to North Florida Avenue. Uh, this is a section that heads east past Chamberlain up to Florida. It is undivided right now. We're looking at adding a small traffic separator along the corridor, which would help with that left turn into North Ola. Um, that congestion is blocking the through traffic as people are trying to make a left. So that one addresses all those issues. The last section is North Avenue, North uh, Florida Avenue to North Nebraska. This runs under 275. As I said, they are going to add in the dual lefts in the future. So there isn't a whole lot more we can do, but add some uh, safety features and operation in here to help them out with that. And in a nutshell, that's all I have on this. If you have any questions, I'm glad to answer them. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for your detailed presentation and your um, work on this and the cooperation and the um, community engagement that you all have done. We, you've always been a partner with me on issues like Bush Boulevard, and I. Uh, greatly appreciate that, obviously. Um, what I want to continue to see with West Bush Boulevard and all of Bush Boulevard really is a sense of urgency. You know, between the, the year 2010 and 2016, there were about 120 uh, serious crashes, including deaths, serious injuries uh, in this area. Uh, you spoke of Chamberlain High School. Um, you know, the, I, I've been working with uh, school board member Cindy Stewart and the principal there. Uh, to try to get uh, education for students in terms of using crosswalks, working with the city to get better crosswalks there for the Chamberlain area. We know the death, I think it was happened in 2016, of the young woman Alex Alexis Miranda, right. whose mother, uh, Valerie Jones, has been a great activist uh, for pedestrian and bicyclist safety, particularly in that area, because it, uh, it's, it's uh, something that's obviously very, very personal to her. Um, when you take a look at the larger Bush area, the big challenge is that that is supposed to serve as our gateway to one of the most uh, uh, invigorating and innovative uh, parts of the city of Tampa, uh, the Bush Boulevard and Fowler area, where you have the University of South Florida, Fowler, Florida Hospital, uh, the VA just outside of the city limits, uh, Moffitt, Shriners, et cetera, et cetera. But yet it really serves as a gateway uh, to neglect. Uh, Bush Boulevard in particular is an area that I really believe has been effectively abandoned by local government over the last few years. Uh, Fowler has received some attention, which is uh, marvelous, but uh, probably because it's close proximity to some of these stakeholders, but Bush Boulevard all throughout has just been abandoned. I've seen it because I grew up in Temple Terrace. 
um, uh, when you get closer to Temple Terrace, that was my hangout as a kid. Uh, I was out at Bush Boulevard a few days ago for something, and I saw where the old, and this is further away from the West uh, Bush part, but I saw where the old sensuous sounds used to be, uh, where I used to buy CDs as a kid for $10 back when that was a great deal. And, um, and, and it's, it's gone. I mean, it's, uh, there's no one there to take the place. You still got the sign there, the Kmart close to the uh, 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 Temple Terrace and Temple Terrace abandoned. I don't know what's going to happen with that, et cetera. Uh, but we've certainly seen that. Tem uh, Bush Boulevard has also become a speedway. Uh, the speed limit in, in many of those areas is 45 miles per hour. People go 55 and much higher in this area where you have so many neighborhoods and businesses frequented by kids and families. It's a speedway. I'd really like to see design occur in, in certain sections so we can get a lower speed limit there uh, because we know the lower speed limits obviously uh, uh, save lives and I would encourage you all to continue to look at that. Something that I was also encouraged by uh, was again education on crosswalks. Um, uh, Chamberlain High School again that's certainly something we have to continue to take a look at. Um, something that really should hopefully improve this area uh, is the all for transportation money. You know I, I was such a strong supporter of all for transportation uh, when it was coming up for a vote because of areas like Bush Boulevard. Uh, it's because of areas like Bush Boulevard that we pushed for all for transportation. Uh, areas that have been forgotten, areas that serve now as gateways uh, to neglect, uh, areas that have been abandoned can now get the proper respect and funding that they deserve. And I think that certainly Bush Boulevard is a really, really big part of that. Um, so I, I just wanted to commend you all for your work and I, I asked you all to come here because this is, again, such a huge part of our city and community and yet it always gets ignored. It's, it's, it's become a, uh, a, a real acute crisis for a lot of the families living out there who have to deal with the constant speeding, the constant abandonment, and just frankly, the lack of respect uh, whenever it comes for folks living there. So I just wanted to thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for the presentation. We really appreciate it. I, I'm in that area a lot. My brother has a, a, a business along that area with my sister-in-law. Uh, right on Bush Boulevard. Uh, I've got a question for you. It looks like there, and obviously this study was started when? Uh, 2017, just short, shortly after the beginning of the year. Yeah. Has there, is there going to be an attempt to uh, maybe refresh this and relook at it uh, concerning uh, transit options, especially as Mr. Vieira said, the offer transportation dollars? As far as? Uh, as far as the design of the road. If there, if there's an example, you know, there is a requirement uh, in uh, the dollars that we have to spend for fixed guideway um, right. uh, presentation. I see that you're using uh, some of the median and taking out some of those turn lanes that are open. As you right. said, they, they become, you know, uh, a separate lane that people uh, tend to use. Uh, I mean, there's possibility that we could redesign the road in order to provide a, uh, a dedicated lane for transit. Possibly. Right. Um, th this uh, section of Bush Boulevard is a constrained corridor, and some of the language behind that is well, yeah. I was going to say, what's a constrained wide, corridor? What do you mean by that? It could be widened in this case uh, for transit. Mm -hmm. it, it's not necessarily going to be allowed to be widened for uh, regular traffic or anything. right. The right. transit options could be something specifically used in this corridor. Well, and the reason I'm asking is because you're, you're talking about acquiring, uh, uh, you know, pieces of land in order to do uh, some uh, sidewalks. Right. Obviously, uh, the acquisition could be used for uh, some of the transit uh, uh, options because if we have a dedicated lane, it makes it easier for, and I think you had mentioned the number of stops that are along uh, Bush Boulevard. That's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, users of transit there. It would make it easier for them to get, you know, uh, an east to west uh, you know, uh, direction for them to, to go wherever they're going, be able to provide more buses, have a bus tra rapid transit on there, and get frequency a lot more, especially with the dollars that are going to be coming in. Right. Uh, and I mean, especially because it's such a well-traveled uh, place. You do have a, a school there. You do have a lot of small businesses along that area. Uh, it would be, I think, helpful if we started to look at that. Obviously, you know, you did this, you started this uh, a year and a half, almost two years ago. Um, now that things have changed and conditions have changed, I would suggest that you probably go back, dust these off a little bit, uh, and uh, they're not that old, I'm just kidding. Yeah. But, I, you know, and, and be able to work with uh, Hart and the county and the city in order to try and put 
some real efforts towards uh, uh, transit. Right, and, and what I did show is uh, the near-term things that we can address sure. now in this new design starting. We do have long-term that, it, like I said, would incorporate some transit features by buying additional right-of-way. Um, that would take some more pd e processes that sure. we have to have to do. So it isn't out of our mind, it's just we're hitting stages of it now, and as things change, <clears throat> we'll address those as they come. I, I, just, hate to, I just hate for you to, to re-engineer the, uh, the road, then uh, re-engineer engineer it again because long range is a little bit different now because we do have dollars or we're supposed to have dollars i should say until the court uh, system is uh, completely done with it uh, but you know we're, we'll be able to work a little bit quicker in terms of providing dollars in order to go forward on some of these projects that can really re-engineer the road and do something different than what we were used to uh, i know you're constrained by dollars just as much as we are uh, but now i think we have a lot better opportunity to cooperate with each other and to really re re redesign the road to provide all types of transportation and not just uh, you know, not just single uh, vehicles. Right. So uh, I appreciate it. I think that there's some opportunities here, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll we'll be able to work together uh, at all those all those um, member entities, park, city, right. county, and you all to try and figure out how we can. Uh, make okay. this a better road okay. we're waiting for that so. i know you are <laughs> we all are thanks so much appreciate thanks. the presentation thank you but uh, next item we go to uh, <coughs> public comments mr chair yes good morning thank you mr chairman the tampa city council welcomes public comment at this time if you're here to speak on a matter that is set on the agenda as a workshop you will have that opportunity to comment after each workshop item. If you're here to speak, let's say, on item number five, the time to speak to uh, that item uh, is at uh, public comment now. Please begin by stating your name for the record, and it is requested that your comments are not directed personally to a council member or staff member, but rather issues directed to the council as a body. City Council appreciates your cooperation in maintaining orderly conduct and proper decorum. Thank you. And tis not Tampa, Florida. I want to talk of proper decor. I'm wearing a hoodie today because I want white people to know, and especially the police and just general white citizens out there, it's okay for black people to dress like this. We're not terrorists. We're not gangsters. We're not thugs. We're not people to be shot at. We're not people for you to call the police on and do all these other things. We dress like this in the summertime and the wintertime. We dress like this because we feel we can dress like this. That's part of the decor. And part of the information that you can't address someone personally, where they ever came up with that idea from. It's just a dictatorial process by which they say, you cannot speak to or look at the king or the queen. That's all that is, nothing more, nothing less. If you come to address something that's going on in your district, if you come to call out your city council person, man or woman, how do you do so? You're limited. You're limiting people First Amendment constitutional rights just to have three minutes, citizens who take three minutes to come here and speak, and then you limit them at that. But I said it before, I'll say it again, and I'll say it right now. It's a stupid, racist, scary city council. Every last one of you up there. You come here every month, month after month, you give police awards. For what? Nothing. Solve some unsolved murders. Solve some of that and then come down here and give an award for that. You come and you give firefighters awards for what? Nothing. Absolutely, positively nothing. People on taxpayers' dollars getting paid and they get an award for that. The general common citizen, man, woman, and child have to get up and go to work every single day. And that's what we do. Solve some of the gentrification fires that's going on where they burn and black people out of our communities. And here we just heard this man came and talked from Florida Department of Transportation and what he talks about, a racist situation from Bush in Nebraska. He went the other way, but all the accidents and all the, the, the car violations take place going the other way through the black neighborhood. And that's what this city council allowed. It's a stupid racist city council, plain and simple. And nothing gets solved and nothing gets resolved. And the fact of the matter is, when you hear the words extermination, when you hear the words 
genocide, when you hear the words ethnic cleansing, when you hear those words, apartheid, they're insulting words. But the words that's used for African people today in 2019 is gentrification. And it's a nasty word. And it's used against us all the time. And this is a do nothing city council. And y'all need to start doing something. Billion dollar budget and nothing happens. Billion dollar deficit. That's where we're at. My name is Pastor Frank R. Williams, Sr., Paradise Missionary Baptist Church. And I think you all know me quite well because I come down here <coughs> frequently. And I want to ask you all a question. I have some scripture here highlighted in the Bible. Can I read them? You got three minutes, sir. Okay, because the last time I come here and wanted to read some scripture, y'all told me I couldn't do it. I'm coming out of the book of Psalms, 37th Division of Psalms. It says, Fret not thyself because of evil doer, neither thou be the enemies against the worker of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither at the green herd. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shall thy dwell in the land, and verity thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and, be thy, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy ways unto the Lord. Trust also in, the, in him who shall bring it to pass. And, it shall, and, he, and he shall bring forth the righteousness as the light and thy judgment at the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself of, because of who prosper in his way, because of the man who bring his wicked device to pass. Cease from anger, forsake wrath. Fret not thyself to do any wise to do evil. And the reason I'm reading this is scripture to you all because uh, we're now here in the United States. 400 years of slavery when they brought slaves from Africa here in the United States. There's never been no justice for black men or black women or children. Things are still going on the same. In fact, it's getting worse. The Ku Klux Klan took off their white hood and put on police uniforms and became judges, lawyers, and they think they can threaten us all the days of our life? I don't think so. We got the Lord on our side. I believe in Jesus Christ. The atheist just the other day in Sebron killed five beautiful women. What for? No reason at all, only because he's an atheist. Atheist, let, let, let me tell y'all something. There's a man that uh, killed a lot of people and he was an atheist. And that was that uh, atheism, I got to tell you, atheism is basically a murder. It's not that they don't believe in Jesus Christ. They hate God Almighty for his creation. And that's why I'm reading this in scripture to you all. And y'all better pay attention to it because God's judgment going to come upon all of us one day, sooner or later. And when I walk out here today, y'all better repent of your sins. All right, anyone else in the public? Yes, your man here should be the mayor of the United of Camp of Broadway. Anyone else in the public wish to speak during this time? Any public comments? All right, seeing none, uh, we will go to the staff report. And um, are y'all ready? Yes. Okay. Morning, Chairman, members of City Council, Brad Baird, Public Works Administrator. <clears throat> Want to uh, talk this morning on uh, water and wastewater infrastructure needs. Um, if I could uh, bring up the presentation, please. <clears throat> so our agenda today, um, I have a few uh, introductory slides that I'll go through uh, to open the presentation. Then we'll uh, follow that by talking about the water master plans 
and that's two water uh, master plans and mm -hmm. uh, the director Chuck Weber will go through those and one is a master plan for the pipeline system and the other is a master plan for the treatment plant <laughs> secondly uh, you know, I, I just have to mention the serendipity of your speaking this morning because, you know, there was a huge water main break just outside <laughs> on National Drive. And I am, <clears throat> not only was I late this morning and Councilman Suarez as well, but I have been getting texts and calls and all kinds of things from people that have been stuck outside literally for hours going around the block. Um, and it, it really underscores the critical nature of what we are dealing with in the city in terms of these incidents. Yeah, I too was uh, stuck in the traffic this morning and uh, just got here a few minutes ago, so I barely got here on time. Um, and um, uh, But then we'll move into the wastewater master plans, which is uh, the, um, also has two master plans, a pi the pipeline system and the treatment plant. Um, and then uh, that'll be followed up by um, a presentation from our CFO, Sonia Little, who will go through um, uh, three funding scenarios for uh, consideration. And then we'll uh, follow that with a question and answer uh, period. So um, I don't have pictures of uh, this morning's uh, break, so uh, I'll, I'll pull up pictures from uh, previous breaks, uh, both on the wastewater side and the water side. Um, the first picture is a, a large force main break in front of one of our master pumping stations on 131st Avenue. Uh, the second picture is a typical wastewater cave-in. This one is just uh, north of Kennedy Boulevard on Armenia. Um, and you see these uh, throughout the city. The next is, uh, you know, our water infrastructure failures are, are also on the increase. Everybody remembers the Rome Avenue uh, main break uh, last year. This Rome Avenue was shut down for over a week. Uh, water got into a few of the homes you see there, um, causing significant damage. We lost millions of gallons of water. Uh, the second picture is the same um, water main break on Rome Avenue and uh, this is what the pipe failure looks like um, after we're able to um, remove it from uh, fr remove it from the hole, and um, it uh, actually was a a break that uh, propagated from um, uh, a mega lug fitting that you see there um, right under the telephone pole that was over tightened uh, maybe 60, 70 years ago. It's a 1950 pipeline and. Uh, so it was a weak spot in the pipeline system, and that's where it failed. The next slide uh, shows um, our total water and wastewater uh, CIP needs over the next 20 years, and that's um, shown in orange or in uh, uh, yellow on your, on your picture up there. Um, and then the blue shows uh, what we have uh, funded starting in uh, 2016 and can fund using existing available resources or, or uh, reserves um, while maintaining reserves in accordance with our internal policies. And uh, as you can see, we have a spike this year in 2019, and that will be the last um, major expenditure for CIPs using existing reserves. At that point, we're down to um, uh, um, a level of reserves for bond coverage and emergencies. Um, so as you can see, um, we are getting dangerously low, continue to fall further behind, and this is simply not sustainable. And my last slide before I turn it over to Chuck Weber is um, an example, if I can get it to move. Uh, of the cost of doing nothing. Uh, this is, uh, happens to be a wastewater example. And um, in those three years, those are our reactive costs to respond to uh, the cave-ins that you saw earlier, uh, to respond to wastewater overflows and, and things of that nature. Um, so, uh, but this applies to the water department as well. Reactive costs continue to rise um, the, these uh, uh,
costs if as they continue to rise and our reserves are, are minimized, um, it uh, exposes us to consent orders and reduction in bond ratings. That's uh, two of the biggest costs of doing nothing. Uh, yeah, um, isn't there also an environmental cost to doing nothing as well? I mean, um, absolutely. The and that, I, that, uh, the environmental cost would be uh, wastewater overflows um, associated with nutrients in the bay that you've seen with other municipalities. Yeah, so this is, this is look, proverbially, this is the tip of the iceberg because this is only, this is only the dollars. Forget about the damage that, that, that is you know, totally not recoverable which is the dumping of wastewater into the into the bay and into our, our drinking water supply. I mean that that's a that's a much larger unquantifiable cost, isn't it? Yes, yes it is and um, uh, yes, the environmental costs are are not quantifiable. Um, what I showed the picture I showed you earlier of the water getting into the houses that is quantifiable and significant especially to those homeowners. Um, the environmental costs um, would be factored into um, what the consent order would be from our regulators. But the so, point is um, that doing nothing is not just a financial cost. It's not just a risk to the bond rating. It's also a risk to our environmental integrity. Correct. And uh, finally, on uh, you know, reactive responses tend to cost roughly twice as much as being proactive. And that, that's a big deal because, um, uh, you know, a, as those costs go up and our reserves continue to drop, um, we um, need, I think that underscores that we need to try to uh, replace and rehabilitate pipelines before they start caving in, um, you know, before they start failing in water main breaks. We need to catch up and uh, become more proactive, um, which will help, but we'll be a, there'll be a period of time where we're both catching up and reacting until we get to that point to where we're uh, starting to uh, get caught up and can get ahead. Uh, uh, yes, Brad, <clears throat> the, 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 uh, the graphic before, I just want to make sure that I get, uh, that I'm correct about this. You've got the, uh, the blue uh, symbol here that, can, that says available for capital projects at, at existing rates. That, and then you also were talking about the reserves. Does that number in include the reserves that you're showing here or not? It includes, the blue includes available reserves to get down to the minimum that we have in our policies. Okay, so, so, so when we're looking at this number, I just wanna make sure we get this right. So you got a 2019 number that's close to $100 million, it looks like. Correct. Correct? Correct. And, that, and how much of that is reserve of, uh, of part of that? Um, the majority of it, and Sonia may be able to address that a little later as to how much that is. Mm -hmm. um, our uh, typical CIP uh, program for each department has been in, uh, um, I believe, the 10 to 15 million range. So right. that would be 30 million out of that. Uh, um, 100 million would not be in res reserves. Would not so, be in reserves. So, yeah, okay. and that's, don't hold me to that. That's going by memory, but so that would take um, roughly 35 million of reserves in each department, you know, back down to the minimum level. But I can't hold you to that? <laughs> no, I can't. You just said it on TV. <laughs> I will, I will uh, try to verify that. And get okay, back no, I'm, I'm just curious because the, the number's a little confusing in terms of what you mean in terms of capital costs because we're not using, we're not using reserves totally for capital costs. Uh, Correct, and that's and so that's what makes it a little bit confusing because you're you're talking about two different things, but about the capital costs themselves, reserves are important in order for us to continue to do uh, the things within uh, you know the enterprise fund in, in, in order to get some dollars out there. But it's not necessarily monies that are used directly for it all the time. That that is correct. Okay. And it, it's I, my, my point on this slide was it's it's our last hurrah to use a significant chunk of those reserves. Right. Okay. You know, so before but, we get into the point to where uh, the expenditures are um, just back to the usual CIP. Okay. So terrific. I, I appreciate it. Thanks for clarifying that because yeah. I, I was a little bit confused on that. So, that thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the, and this, this is uh, available reserves or the available reserves. Okay, so 
um, Sonia just gave me some updated numbers, which I was off on. Um, so wastewater has available reserves of 39 million, water has 50 million. So um, it makes up uh, a larger uh, portion of that spike than, than I previously said. Okay. Um, so back, and I'll wrap this up. Um, basically, we need to start to catch up, become more proactive. This problem is not going away, and it's getting worse every year. Uh, what we experienced this morning is going to happen more and more often. Um, you saw the one downtown that created gridlock, uh, the water main break downtown, but we have um, 30 breaks around the city right now in various stages of repair and restoration that we're, we're nursing, if you will. So this is uh, going to continue to get worse. Chuck and Eric uh, both have uh, more detailed numbers later in the presentation. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to Mr. Chuck Weber. Good morning, Chuck Weber, Water Department Director. Uh, let me pull up the presentation. Oh, going on. Oh. Okay, as, uh, as Brad mentioned, we did two master plans uh, starting uh, just a couple years ago. Uh, we started the process, uh, one for the water treatment facility and the other for the distribution system. For the water treatment facility, uh, the process started with uh, a detailed assessment of thousands of pieces of our equipment, uh, evaluations of our treatment processes, we did benchmarking to look at how well we were doing with our treatment facility co uh, as compared to other similar treatment facilities in the state and throughout the country. Um, we were trying to determine, are we getting the most out of what we have? So after evaluating all that, we looked at different alternatives uh, for repairing and uh, replacing infrastructure as well as uh, expanding the plant to deal with uh, additional demand in the future. So we identified our needs, uh, we, we prioritized the different projects, we developed uh, uh, construction phasing and cost estimates. This slide shows uh, the capacity of the drinking water treatment plant. Right now we're in the range of about 110 to 115 million gallons per day. And in 2032, we're gonna need roughly 134 and uh, really we're out in uh, 2040 we're going to need something close to 140 million gallons a day so we definitely need to expand the facility as well as well as uh, replace uh, old infrastructure this slide shows uh, the approach to the master planning for the distribution system uh, the pipes are buried and the fix most of the fixtures are you, you can't get to so how we approached it was looking at the uh, probability of failure, which includes the number of breaks that we've had on each segment of pipe, the remaining life, and each segment of pipe, and the type of soil that those pipes are in. The percentage numbers there show the weighting factor that was used in the overall, uh, the weight of each of those factors in that category. Uh, we also looked at the consequence of failure. Uh, well, you know, what would happen if, if a pipe failed going to a hospital? Uh, what would happen if it failed in a population that, uh, where there's a lot of population density? Um, what would happen if it happened under a major thoroughfare? So uh, all those factors went into evaluating uh, each segment of pipe in our distribution system and determining when they need to be replaced and how much it would take to replace each segment of pipe. Chair, if I could. Um, Chuck, when you're talking about probability of failure, when you go breaks on individual pipes and then remaining life and then aggressive soil area, um, what, what are you talking about when you talk about breaks on individual pipes, meaning the age of a pipe that you know about in particular areas and the probability of failure because of their age? Well, there, there, there were three factors we considered. Okay. Uh, the number of breaks. So every time a main breaks, mm -hmm. we log it, we record it, we, so we know how many times we have a main break on a section of pipe and the length of time between each main breaks. So that's, that's one factor we looked at. Um, then we also look at the age of the pipe mm -hmm. because age is another factor in whether or not a pipe is uh, going to fail. Um, 
I have another slide later on that I okay. want to show that really addresses the age of pipe in our system. I think it'll uh, address that factor better. Okay. Well, I, I get. Could you say the first part of it again? Because I, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about what you're saying there. Okay. Uh, when we have a main break, we record it. Right. So, and we know what segment of pipe it's on. So over time, we can measure the number of main breaks on each segment of pipe. And the segment of pipes that have more main breaks on them in a shorter amount of time have, are more likely to fail. Okay, now, now why is that? I mean, you know, it, what's, what's the factor that, be, that you base that on? It's not because there's a main break, it may be because of an age, but I mean, what if it's a, new, a newer pipe? I mean, what makes that determination? I'm, I just I guess I'm confused about that. Well, uh, basically, you know, if, if your history shows that you're having a large number of main breaks on a segment of pipe, mm -hmm. the likelihood of having a large number of main breaks on that pipe moving forward statistically always shows that it's going to be higher. Yeah, but is it now, based, on, are is it based on water pressure or something? I mean, what else? Is, there are other reasons. Uh, uh, the, the main break that Brad showed earlier on Rome, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the, the mega lug fitting. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if it hadn't have been over tightened and caused a micro crack okay. that over time expanded, that could have. So if you had a lot, uh, a segment of pipe where that was put in at the same time that had a lot of those same mega lugs that were over tightened, the it. likelihood of that failure is greater. Got it. Okay. That, that explains it a little bit better. I appreciate okay. that. <laughs> you know, sure. the way you said it, it can seem like a circular argument there and I wasn't sure I was getting what you were trying to say. So I appreciate Fair you telling enough. us Fair that. Enough. So. Uh, and then uh, the other thing on the uh, remaining life, when you say 45%, that means that a pipe that is less than 30 years old, 40 years old, what are we talking about? The 45% the represents the weighting factor of those three criteria for probability of failure. Okay. So there was 45 for age, 45 uh, for uh, the number of breaks, mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, the aggressive soil made up 10. So okay. together, that's 100 percent for the. For All the right. Weight. So shifts in soil can cause a water main break because of um, it's not stable anymore. Underneath well, it? where you have acidic soil, mm -hmm. um, it can be aggressive, and uh, we have a lot of cast iron pipe. I got it. Okay. So it's the acidity in the in the soil, not necessarily in movement in soil. Um, it can be that, but it's not necessarily that. It it can be movement of soil as well, but okay. uh, the corrosiveness of the soil play it plays a larger factor. Got it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Uh, hold on. on the next slide here, this slide has a lot of statistics on it, but what I really uh, want to, to focus on is all these blue lines represent pipelines, and they're all in our streets throughout the city. Uh, the, the, the last statistic is the most important thing, I think, on this slide. 98% of this you can't see. It's, it's buried. And so, um, we, if we replace this, you're not going to see much of a difference, and it's going to cost a lot of money to replace our pipe. So I just wanted to point this out. This is not something that's above ground. This is all something you can't see. Uh, another interesting thing to put this in perspective is if you take all those pipes and you stretch them out, they'll get you from here to, to California. It's a lot of pipe. <laughs> Now, this slide uh, I wanted to, I referred to earlier about the age of our pipe. And this is really why we're starting to see a spike in the number of main breaks. Um, as you can see, in the 1940s, we started putting in a lot of pipe. Uh, there was a growth boom back then. A lot of this pipe was cast iron pipe. And our cast iron pipe, because of the type of soils we have it in, it's, it's going to last 80 to 100 years. Well, if you put 80 years on top of 1940, we're at the beginning of this problem. So we need to start addressing it. And it's not gonna go away in a decade or two. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out is we're not alone. Uh, there's a lot of cities throughout the United States that are experiencing this same situation. Uh, just to kind of underscore the increase we're seeing in the number of main breaks uh, over the last three years, uh, they've roughly doubled. Uh, so. We can expect to see more main breaks like Rome and uh, more main breaks like the one this morning uh, more frequently for a little while until we get on top of this. This next slide kind of uh, illustrates some of the larger projects we have uh, in the master plan. Uh, the Tampa Augmentation Project, uh, while it's significant uh, overall, it's really just a small piece of the needs. 
the pipeline renewal and replacement is roughly uh, 500 miles and $672 million over 20 years. Um, our pump stations at the treatment plant are uh, still running the original pumps. They're close to 80 years old, uh, which is a testament to the maintenance uh, that the, the workers have done over the decades to keep pumps like that running. But at this point, there are no manufacturers for parts. So anytime those pumps break, we have to custom make them, which is more expensive than buying new pumps. So at this point, they've reached the end of life. We have to build new pump stations. Um, the ozone system uh, was put in relatively recent, but those aren't made to last for uh, as long as pumps. Uh, they're, they're about a 20 year uh, item. And so we're coming up to the end of life on the ozone system and that will need to be replaced. And as I mentioned before, uh, there's an expansion component uh, to increase the capacity from 120 MGD to 140 MGD. And we're also looking at using ion exchange as an additional treatment process uh, to help us uh, save on chemical costs, but also to provide an additional barrier uh, for treatment purposes. This next slide uh, kind of sums up the total of the needs by categorizing them. Uh, the bottom line is uh, over the next 20 years, uh, we need about $1.5 billion uh, in uh, infrastructural renew just for the water department. So, uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Eric Weiss. Good morning, Eric Weiss, Wastewater Department Director. You're gonna see a lot of similarities because we have pumps and pipes and treatment plants. Good jobs. So what makes up the Wastewater Department? We did a master plan for the Howard F. Curran Advanced Wastewater Treatment Plant, our only treatment plant down at the port. And then we did a separate one for everything else which is the 1,700 miles of pipe, 225 pumping stations, 30,000 mantles. So those are the two master plans that we did. Getting into the first one, at the treatment plant. You know, the treatment plant was originally constructed in the early 1950s as just a primary basic plant. Became an advanced plant in the 70s, and the last major upgrade started in the late 1980s to increase the capacity of the plant to 96 million gallons per day what we could treat but that's now 30 years old in our business in wastewater uh, it's very wastewater is very corrosive hydrogen sulfide gases and sewer gases really eat up pumps pipes and structures so our new 30 year old plan is not new anymore so we hired an outside consultant to do two basic things one as a phase one go through the whole plan look at the thousand pieces of equipment familiar rise themselves with the treatment plant, talk to operators so you can get an as is. You know, where are we at today? And once they could do that, they went out and uh, did big studies. One, you know, is the capacity good enough or not? Do we have to build new stuff? You know, the next thing they looked at was new technologies. Because over the last 30 years, a lot has happened in our business. You know, new cutting edge and bleeding edge things. So that was completed. And what did they come up with? First one, no major capacity issues. The 96 million gallons a day that we're permitted now is plenty. You know, over the last few years, we've averaged 55 to 60 million gallons a day. So lots of capacity. So we don't have to build new things. Um, the treatment process that we did back in the 1970s to make it advance has held up all these years. You know, and it's kind of a model throughout the whole Southeast. We get people coming in and looking at it because it's easy to use and tried and true. And when you look at some of the newer technologies, you may get a little efficiency, but there's a huge capital cost to build those new things. And, you know, the payback um, wasn't attractive. Um, but the biggest thing is, again, 30-year-old plant, since the last upgrade, you need a lot and significant amount of rehabilitation. Okay. And that's it for the treatment plant. Those are what the study showed over 20 years, about 562 uh, million. As you can see, almost half of it's the first five years, because that's getting past this initial bubble of the things that need rehabilitated and replaced, and then it kind of evens out in the out years. Okay. Jump into the other master plan, which is our collection system. We did that in-house. Um, as you can see, about 60% of our system is over 50 years old. 
pipe-wise, these are gravity pipes, about 20% of it is 70 years old. And what does that mean? And you look at the graphic to the right, um, that's over, that's every year over the last seven years, the number of cave-ins that have gone up. And like what Brad said before, you know, that's a very reactive cost. You know, it could happen out in the street, we mobilize, get out there and fix that one break, but, you know, a lot of times neighborhoods were built all at the same time. So 20 feet away, you could see another one in the future, and you've probably seen that down the middle of the street before a bunch of patches. Um, so that's what we've got. And how do we assess this in-house? We're lucky enough with gravity pipes, we have a fleet of seven TV trucks, where you may have seen the big white truck set up in the middle of the road over a manhole. And what we do is we stick a camera down there, and they can record and assess the condition of the pipes. And these guys are certified, our in-house guys, so if they were doing it in Philadelphia or Los Angeles, you know, they score it the same, the condition. So, like Chuck, you know, we did a matrix analysis. Look at the condition of the pipe, because we could actually put eyes on it. How old is it? You know, what side, what the material is, is one side of the equation, and the other is the consequence of failure. Is it in front of a hospital? Is it in front of a school? You know, if there was a cave-in, what's the impact? So you put those all together, and you came up with 445 miles of the, of the number one priority pipe. And that's shown in this graphic in red. And then the, the stuff in yellow is, is bad and about to get bad in the near future. And that's shown in yellow. As you can see, it's mostly some of the worst pipe is concrete pipe we have that goes up north of downtown, Nebraska in that area. And it's in heading into West Tampa. Um, you know, unlined cast iron pipe, the sewer gases eat it up a lot faster than PVC or other things. And, and to add on that, you've seen a lot of those sewers are in alleys. So for us to get back there, you have to move fences or move sheds and those kind of things. It's not easy like you could work, you know, in a residential street. Pumping stations, 225 pumping stations. This analysis was a lot more straightforward. We broke them down into a, large, a cost for a large station, medium station, and a small station. They last 20 years. We know when we have last did the last big rehab, so you can just extrapolate how much money you need to get that done. And that's on this slide. Okay, force mains. We have about 300 miles of force mains. And what this is, this is a sewer pipe that's under pressure from a pump, pumping it uphill. Um, had a lot of problems recently. Davis Island, this, this summer we had a break and that's the picture you see there. That's us putting a new one. That's the Peter and Onite Airport off to the right, off to the left. Um, Harbor Island, you probably heard our issues out there um, with an aging pipeline. Yukon and 12th, we did a big project this year um, as an emergency. And the biggest thing to me about force means is it's not easy to fix sometimes. You know, you can't just turn a valve and stop the wastewater from coming because it's coming on you no matter what. So it has a lot more environmental risk of a break more than just a cave-in where you could just put a pump and go down to the next manhole. That's the cost for the force mains. And this is just a recapitulation of the whole thing. So over 20 years, we're going to need about $1.4 billion to catch up. Thank you. Good morning, Council Member Sonia Little, Revenue and Finance. So uh, the second component or, or part to the master plans that you just heard about from, from our water and wastewater directors as well as Mr. Baird is uh, the funding strategy as it relates to how are we going to uh, generate sufficient revenues in order to address these major capital needs for both systems. Uh, the city in preparing a funding strategy engaged an independent rate consultant who has been working with us over the past uh, year or two to develop various scenarios to get us to where we need to be over the next 20 years. So if I can ask that the presentation be brought back up. The, the rate study focused primarily on three major areas, and that's the consumption rate, the base charge, and miscellaneous fees and charges. There are several miscellaneous fees and charges that we took a look at 
Uh, we have a lot more de data, better efficiency, so we wanted to make sure that those fees were appropriately pr placed. But um, if you'll recall, the last rate increase that we had for our system was over seven years ago, and it was phased in for both systems for, for water. It was between the years of 2007, with the final increase being in 2011, and for wastewater, it began in 2009, again with the last increase occurring in 2011. So where we are right now with our current rate structure is that the city only charges a consumption rate, and the consumption rate is tiered to promote water conservation. However, the current rate study that we have, and we're going to go over the major uh, components of it, it contemplates a combination of a consumption rate and a base charge. Um, we found that a pure consumption rate structure does not guarantee that we'll be able to cover our fixed cost, our fixed cost that we have to pay for our system no matter what happens, no matter how much we consume, we're going to have chemical charges, we're going to have personnel charges, we're going to have electrical charges. And just to point out that our system is one of the few, maybe even one of the last ones in the state of Florida that does not have a base rate component included in the, cons in the rate structure. Um, just to put it in perspective, just to share with you a real life example of how the absence of a base rate impacts the city, is that back in 2009 when the city was uh, experiencing the impact of the recession, we also had a drought. And that drought caused uh, the city to impose watering restrictions. And what I'm told by the then water director, now, now Mr. Baird, an administrator for the system, was that consumption dropped 30 million gallons in one day after the water restriction was imposed. So it did what it was supposed to do. Uh, and that was to uh, encourage conservation in light of the drought. However, what that did to the system is that uh, over two budgetary uh, cycles, the system lost revenues in excess of $25 million. In addition to that, because of the drought, the city had to purchase water from Tampa Bay Water, about $10 million or so, so we had a double whammy. So the consultants strongly recommend, and, and uh, our staff agrees, that to in include a base charge moving forward protects the system against uh, the impact of another re recession, uh, improved efficiencies as far as lower consumption, so that we can always assure that we can cover at least the basic cost and needs of the system. So Mr. Baird shared with you back on slide five, I believe it was, the gap in funding or revenues available to cover um, our capital needs, the yellow or orange in some cases um, on the, in your hard copy piece shows the master plan. But if you jump down to the bottom of the, of the graph, the green portion is over the next 20 years, the operating expenses for the system. That's the all in, I call this the all in chart. Um, and then the purple line just above that is the existing debt service. It does not contemplate the issuance of any, any more debt. So that coupled with the line that goes straight through the middle uh, reflects our operating revenues as they stand today. So basically what this all-in chart tells us that if we don't do anything, that the gap just really continues to widen. For example, we can cover through 2025 our operating expenses, our debt, and a portion of the master plan, just that little sliver below the line is what we can cover, but you can see the uncovered portion. And then when we get to 2025, we start bordering or teetering over just being able to even cover our debt service and operating expenses. Quick question about the chart. On, on under 2019, it looks like, and I'm, I'm just looking at it roughly, it looks like there's a $75 million difference between where that existing debt service and payment line is and uh, the operating revenue at existing rates. 
Is it somewhere in that neighborhood? That's or? in the neighborhood, yes, okay. sir. So uh, what does that mean? I mean, what is it? Basically, that? In, in 19, as uh, Brad mentioned, we have like a spike mm -hmm. where we're using a large portion of the reserves to pay some of the capital needs. Okay. That chunk there. It, it goes back to that other uh, chart that, you, that uh, Brad was showing. Earlier. That's correct. Okay. I just That's want to make correct. sure we, I was following the same thing. Yes, Thank sir. you. Thank you, Chair. So on slide 32, we have provided a scenario of the um, a summary of the scenarios that we'd like to discuss. To discuss, as I mentioned with uh, the Ray consultant, we reviewed and analyzed numerous scenarios, but the top three are provided here. Uh, the first one, scenario A, we wanted to see. Um, what we could fund of the master plan if we conservatively assumed a increase in the consumption rate and added a base charge. All of the scenarios added a base charge, include the base charge, which we don't currently have today. Scenario B, on the other hand, will fund 100% of the master plan that you've heard about and 100% of TAP. And the only difference on scenario C is that it will exclude TAP. So some of the details on the plan is just to recap before we go into the details. The cost of capital for the water system, you, sh you saw the list um, that was provided previously, about $1.5 million in today's uh, cost and wastewater at about $1.1 million. But in the modeling for the rate structure, we wanted to make certain that we would be able to cover any inflationary cost. So inflationary impacts have been added. So projected for the 20-year plan, the cost of capital would be $1.8 million for water, billion, $1.8 billion for water, and $1.3, almost $1.4 billion for wastewater, giving us a total of 3.2 just under 3.2 billion. So what does that mean per scenario as it relates to rates? Again, reminding you that uh, each of these scenarios will include a base charge. And the base charge is calculated based on one ERU, which is an equivalent residential unit and that equates to roughly 6,000 gallons per month of consumption. But the base charge in that case, beginning in 2020, fiscal year 2020, would be an increase of $4 per month per ERU, and then increasing between the years of 2021 to 2034 at $2 per month per E. Are you and then maxing out um, in year 2034 at $32 per month per ERU. So it also includes a, the 3% increase on the consumption rate as we discussed. But it will cover 100% of our, our operations and maintenance. But under this scenario, it does not cover 100% of the master plan. It would only cover 79%, leaving about $700 million unfunded over the 20-year master plan. And the bottom bullet um, merely just shows you the funding sources for the master plan between cash and debt. Scenario B has the same base charge, assumes the same base charge, but in order to fund 100% of the master plan and 100% of TAP, adjustments had to be made to the consumption rate that was charging. And, and at the end of these, this summary of each of the scenarios will show you the impact to the customer rate. But in scenario B, the consumption rate for water for 20 and 21 was the 3%, and then increasing to 15% in FY22 to 25, and then 1% thereafter through the year, fiscal year 2040. And then wastewater very similarly varying 
uh, at 3% in the years 2020 through 31, and then 4% annual increase through FY 2040. So basically what the last two scenarios do in order to fund 100% of the cap master plan is it matches the revenue needs to the construction schedule that's been proposed by the uh, consulting engineers. Scenario C, um, again, the only difference is that it does not include TAP when compared to the prior scenario, and it provides the same base charge but with varying consumption rates to match the master plan under this scenario. So if we want to take a look of what that means. Yes, sir. One question on that, on not including the TAP. On the TAP uh, portion that you're looking at on all scenarios, is that the 350 or half of 350? 350 That's million. the 350. All total of it? Total. So if you get any grants, or is that I reduced? would point out that these scenarios do not, these, this is a conservative approach because we have not secured any grants. Right. So during the term, and thank you for reminding me of that, um, under the 20 year plan, the city will continually go after grant funding to push down the cost to the thank customer. You so on slide 37, uh, we wanted to take a look and the consultant provided to us what, to put it in perspective, how our rates under the proposed scenarios compare to our, that of our peers. So if you look at the chart in the first two bars, you see that the existing utility bill for water, wastewater customers who average roughly 6,000 monthly gallons per month, 6,000 gallons per month is at $41.29. When you compare that to the first year that would include a base rate on the prior scenarios, the, the monthly bill is estimated for that average customer to go up to $46.50. So the black line going all the way across is an average of the peers that you see on this table. And that survey average as provided by the independent consultant is $80.57. So you'll see both that our existing rates and the proposed rates, um, the city of Tampa is far below uh, the average of that of our peers. One other question, Chairman. So that that mean on your 6,000 gallons of water a month, about eight units of water. Am I correct to that? That's correct. All right, thank you. That's correct. Um, so when you take like City of St. Petersburg, which is now at almost a hundred dollars uh, a month, is that include? Does that include the money to pay the consent orders to uh, the state when they violate and and dump water into the into the bay? No. I would assume that um, they, if they operate similarly, that they would have reserve have to tap reserves in order in order to. But if their reserves fell below the twenty percent threshold, they'd have to raise the rates to cover it. Right, and that's one of the things uh, you'll see that um, in a subsequent slide. If I can just take you to the following slide, and I think this will get to the heart of where you may be going, Councilman. So this slide takes that still that $80.57 uh, survey average, the horizontal blue line. And the lines that you see below that uh, that are rising reflect each of the scenarios that we talked about over a seven year period. So you can clearly see that if our peers do nothing for seven years, which is highly unlikely with their rates, compare that to what the city of Tampa is doing with its proposed rate structure under any of those scenarios, we are still far below in every year. I, I guess where I was going with the question was, it, it seems to me that uh, whether you raise the rates or not, you're gonna have to raise the rates. Because if you don't raise the rates and things continue to deteriorate, you're just gonna pay it on the back end. You're just gonna pay, you're, you're gonna either fall behind in your bond covenants or you're in your, your bond rating and, and pay higher interest rates or you're gonna to have to ultimately tap the, the rate payer 
to to make up that difference. So it's 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 one or the other. In one scenario, you get the work done. In the other scenario, you don't get the work done. That's correct. And and uh, the reason for this proposal and this 20-year plan today is to be proactive because either way, you know, as they just indicated, we'll have to do it because we have no choice because a pipe has has blown and you still have to pay it. But at some point, we will have no reserves left because the system revenues don't support the operations, maintenance, and the forward-looking uh, construction needed to maintain the system. Yeah, I, I just want to say, you know, Councilman Suarez and I have been going to these forums. We get asked a lot of questions. This never comes up. <laughs> this is the most important issue facing the city right now, and it never comes up. Very bad that it doesn't come up. It comes up with me. Nobody understands what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, and um, this, this bottom table on slide 38 provides under each scenario how year over year the, the residential customer that averages the 6,000 gallons per month in consumption uh, how the rate changes year over year through the year 2026 to support uh, the almost three, well, the three billion dollar 20 year plan. And so along those lines, uh, we are currently evaluating a possible customer assistance program for those that any incremental increase may be impactful. Uh, it'll take some time and we're going through um, to determine a fair and equitable, equitable program to determine who would receive assistance and the type of assistance that uh, the city could provide. And then along with that would obviously come, include program outreach and monitoring um, and certainly a, a very clear, distinguished uh, funding source for the program. Um, I've got a quick question. Mr. Miranda kind of touched on this about um, different grants and funds, and I wanted to ask about the wastewater treatment, uh, primarily in terms of, uh, I believe the state still has a revolving loan fund uh, on that. Obviously, that still is based on rate changes and the way that we pay back those loans. Uh, how many or how much uh, money are we getting now from, uh, from the revolving loan fund? And is the amount of money that we're talking about for wastewater, is that going, to, what's the percentage of it that goes back to that? If you follow what I'm saying, because if we're bonding specifically for ourselves as opposed to repaying a loan that we're getting from uh, the state because of the revolving loan fund, you know, what's, what's the difference with the number that we're talking about? Okay. So the way that the, the, the bonding between fixed rate bonds and the state revolving loan fund will be structured throughout the 20 year plan is that the modeling allows for the greatest bit of flexibility because we're, we're determined to get as much grant funding mm -hmm. as we need, <clears throat> as we can acquire. So that grant funding will actually buy down the amount of debt that we'll have to issue to satisfy our needs. When we determine the amount of debt that's needed, we'll evaluate whether or not it makes sense to do a long-term fixed rate public offering mm -hmm. or to get, obtain a loan from the state revolving loan fund. And right now, we currently have roughly 16 million of the total almost 200 million outstanding debt coming mm -hmm. from the state revolving loan fund. But okay. it will be throughout the 20 years an analysis and comparison for the lowest cost, depending on uh, the nature, the availability of the state revolving loan funds and the right. rate and exactly how much money we'll need. Yeah, because wastewater treatment plants typically have a 20 year shelf life anyway. Uh, and so those, those bonds, excuse me, those loans are based on that uh, scenario of 20 years. And I know that the revolving loan fund is supposed to go out and bond out the additional dollars and be able to sell those bonds on the open market in order to repay uh, back in, but the rates have to be uh, significant enough to be able to repay those loans too. So I know that you know that rate analysis is done, even though it is not a, uh, a 
bond that we are issuing, we still have to look at rates in order to repay back any of those, uh, any of those loans. And then, of course, with water, there are some grants available, but usually they're not that significant in order to be able to provide the kind of help we need at such a large scale. So, exactly. I mean, at least what I've seen, so. You're exactly right. And um, we have, for the last several years, trying to tap every possible resource even before the master plan was completed and those those opportunities are very very slim and in fact i think if i'm not mistaken and we've had these discussions over the last few years that if we don't do certain things and we do have water main breaks and we do have some of the scenarios that mr cohen was talking about where we have uh you know discharges into the into the bay that that cost that's going to uh, go into it in terms of you know uh, uh, you know, consent orders, things like that. In addition, uh, the amount of money that um, we're going to lose because uh, some of those grants are based on the fact that we're not doing uh, those bad things to the environment. Uh, and, that, and that, to me, I think is a, a, a real important part of this, which is that it's not a, just about getting money in order to provide the, the, uh, the uh, you know, the work uh, and the capital work done, but it also is about making sure that those future costs are even smaller and you know future costs are really what's going to kill us and eat us up if we don't put money into it now so yes, i appreciate it thank you that's it all right we thank you very much thank you council okay all right we'll go to um our workshops and Good morning, Council. Right. Bob McDonough, Economic Development. We are here this morning to present a uh, very strategic and, and far-reaching parking analysis. And this is a little different than anything that we've done before or participated with. Because most of the time what we've looked at are city assets and city parking plans. This has been a program that was originally initiated by the Downtown Partnership and SPP and the downtown CRA uh, participated in it with funding by getting more data points to make sure of the accuracy of the program. So it's interesting because it seems as if every group that comes up to you tells a different story about parking. The small developer says there's plenty of parking, we shouldn't make them do it. Uh, Mr. McDonough, excuse me Sir? for a second. Uh, Ms. Shev, would you notify these people out there that we're still in a session? Thank you. Uh, you could okay so as i said the small developer will tell you we don't need to have any more parking there's plenty if you talk to the folks at the Stras or my folks at the convention center or the amley arena or on occasion the parks department they'll tell tell you that we're woefully short you listen to the commercial real estate people and they'll say no we need more parking to be successful like west Shore is as well so this this study has looked at the entire inventory the cities, flat lots, structured parking, those that belong to private entities, they've looked at uh, parking rates, they've looked at how other cities have looked at the exact same situation that we have. And so they're getting ready to present this, they've just finished with it. And uh, the, the city right now is looking at it and evaluating our options and some of the things that they talk about, things that we might look at and incorporate in the not too distant future and then again, long-term things that we would incorporate in our parking. So I think you're going to find it fascinating because it, it dispels a lot of the stories that you hear almost on a daily basis. Thank you. All right. Yes, sir. Good morning, Council. My name is Joel Mann. I'm with Stantec Consulting Services, and I'm a transportation planner working for the Downtown Partnership and SVP, and I have been the lead consultant on the parking study so far that Mr. McDonough introduced. We have a presentation to share with you, if we could pull that up. Um, I will run through this very quickly. Um, we've had the chance to speak to some of you about this individually, and you know that there is a lot of data in this study, so I'm gonna try to move through very quickly so that there's plenty of time for you to answer, ask questions. Um, this is sort of scratching the surface, so uh, we, can, we can get into more of this, and we have some case studies that we're happy to share as well. Um, as Mr. McDonough said, there's, you hear many stories about parking, 
But the common theme in them always seems to be, well, we don't have enough. You know, there needs to be more parking in downtown. Despite that concern that you hear from most of your constituents, the findings of our work show that there is actually available parking. That's not necessarily parking where people want it to be or um, at the right times, but part of our work was a comprehensive data collection effort, uh, the first that's been done in Tampa, to our knowledge, that counted all of the inventory of, of parking that is built today, and we went through and counted at multiple times during the year how that parking is being used. We counted every parking space and how many cars were in them. So it's, it's kind of indisputable you know, fact, here's how many cars were there. Now we don't know why they were there or if they have monthly permits or if they're in reserved spaces. This is simply the number of cars and parking spaces. Um, we counted, um, as Mr. McDonough mentioned, the parking that the city owns and operates which accounts for about a third of the 24,000 spaces in our greater kind of downtown study area. But we counted private parking as well. And this was on street and off street, this was lots, this was garages, this was everything in an area basically from 275 down to the channel and the river over to Meridian and the channel district. And in that area, you know, the, the striking finding of, of ours was that even at the busiest times that we observed, there is availability. There are 6,000 spaces, about a quarter of that inventory, that are not being occupied at that time. And again, you know, there are many reasons why that happens that we'll get into in a moment, but that in and of itself is, is a pretty bold you know, finding to start with. And this is what it looks like. In locations where people want to be, you'll have some parking that isn't used you know, at times of a big event or a big demand right next to parking that is being used. Um, Part of the reason that that happens is that pricing right now is, is not really set up for rational choices. Some of the pricing is, is out of balance. The map that you have in front of you here shows um, several parking facilities around downtown. The ones that are outlined in the black line are, are operated by the city. And these are, these are the prices for an average monthly permit. Some <laughs> sell a couple of tiers of price. Um, but this is generally, you know, by the color coding, you're, you have higher prices in the core of downtown, you get lower out toward the edge, that, that makes sense. But the city's prices are generally below what the private sector is charging. And there's, you know, they're popular for that reason. People want to get into those parking spaces because they cost less, and they end up with fairly long waiting lists for that reason. Um, another part of the dynamic is the pricing between the street spaces and the garage spaces is reverse what it typically is in other cities. Those street spaces are the most desirable. Of course, people want to park there, they're convenient. They should be treated as the most valuable and right now pricing is often below what it is in a garage right next to it. Um, just a few quick points on what price is. The, you know, the street spaces are generally lower than the off street spaces. But when you think about the cost of monthly permits as well, which are a very popular choice, by far the most, um, the, the most prevalent in the parking system, you know, the, the price of parking compared to what it would be if we built more is also not quite matching up. If, if you were to build more parking as shown in that little break even point, you know, that's what it costs to construct and finance parking over time. And the, the range of what's being charged for that parking is below that. Um, monthly permits, like we said, are, are very heavily used in the system. Um, they've been, you know, the option that everybody defaults to for a long time. But if you take the cost of a monthly permit and you break that down to compare that to hourly or daily parking, it's really cheap. It's, you know, it's 11 cents an hour on average versus a low of 75 cents an hour in that, in that lower bar down there. Um, for paying in an off-street lot if you were simply paying by the hour. It's no wonder people are choosing those monthly permits. They're a great bargain right now. And the pricing has, has manipulated the market somewhat. This was the slide we showed a second ago. These are the prices of monthly permits at these city facilities. I mentioned they, they've driven popularity and people have gotten on wait lists. Those wait lists are sometimes so long, you know, you have two or three times the number of permits that could be sold at a lot of garage actually sitting there on that wait list waiting to get into it. Um, and you know, it's the monthly permits that are really strong in the market. When you look at the facilities, these are all the parking garages and lots downtown, and we've made them into towers here, kind of extruded them by the number of spaces. So Fort Brook is by far the largest, over 2,500 spaces in that garage. But you look at what the, these are how they're used. The cooler colors towards blue and green are, are less used, getting below 50% utilized and the yellows and the oranges are, are more used, 70% and up.
but you look at the dominant use in each of those garages <coughs> and they're, they're kind of locked up. These are your you know, biggest facilities and some of the most popular and many of them are tied up in, in monthly permits. And like I said, that's a great bargain for people. There's no real incentive to ask for anything different. Um, part of that though, I think is a cultural thing or you know, a real estate dynamic sort of thing that downtown for a long time has, has seen West Shore as a competitor, as an office submarket. And West Shore was built on the premise of being able to provide a lot of parking. It's been passed on at very low cost or, or no you know, nominal cost to its tenants. And so downtown's been feeling like it needs to compete. Um, and, and what we've observed from that is that continuing to do that you know, may not let downtown continue to grow. In fact, it won't. Um, if you consider downtown compared to West Shore as two office markets, by most measures, West Shore has always been twice as large but downtown's really been catching up. This is just in a year and a half. There's been 10 times the absorption. Vacancy rates in downtown are on par with West Shore now. It's getting pretty tight. There's not a lot of space left. And yet, this has been done with only half the parking you know, per, um, per square footage that West Shore has. Um, but, but downtown is changing, and we would, uh, you know, we would maintain that Trying to compete and play in that same game really isn't relevant anymore. You know, downtown is a different kind of place. It's dynamic. The parking needs are therefore much more dynamic. You have, of course, special events um, getting more and more frequent and popular. It's almost like two separate downtowns when the special events are happening. And as downtown's land use profile is changing, it's not just an employment center anymore. You know, thinking about how development comes in and and having to build parking, you know, that the idea that everyone has their own parking space in downtown is adding to cost. You know, we all know about the challenges that Tampa and other American cities have faced with housing affordability and, and parking's a portion of that. That keeps, you know, financing costs higher, that keeps the rents higher. So some of our observations, this is sort of where we pass from the cold hard data of the study into our, our um, professional opinion. And, and things that we would tee up as directions forward as we continue to work with staff is that, you know, we've heard from many people that it's, yeah, there's, there's unused parking out on the edge, but nobody wants to walk that far. No one wants to get there. I agree with that. I grew up in Tampa. I don't live here anymore, but I know the summers. I know how it is trying to walk six <coughs> blocks when you've, you know, when you're dressed like this. And that's, uh, that's certainly a concern that Downtown Partnership, the City, Heart have tried to address with circulator service. But this might have a price solution. You know, if you look, if you go back to this idea of the wait lists and who's on them, when these wait lists are two and three times as long as the number of permits you could sell because they're $30 a space, that suggests to us that when you get the price right, people are willing to compromise somewhat. And the walking distance from some of those is really not much different from uh, more remote parking that's being used today. So. That points to a mobility um, side of this and that we need to be thinking about the mobility options to make that walking better or make it more attractive, but be balancing and managing so that people are, are inclined to move out to that because the price is right. And, and addressing this price issue, I want to be very clear, is not just about increasing prices, um, especially on the city facilities. It's about finding balance in some of these places where street parking and garage parking are kind of lopsided that we you know, raise the street parking rates if we need to, we lower garage parking in, in some locations. The most important point that I want to make with this, since we brought up that this is only a third of the downtown parking that the city controls, is that the private sector has a very important role in this as well. And the way we would um, kind of lay this out is that there are three major actors in parking in downtown. The city's one of them, but the downtown partnership by having such a broad base of constituents and knowing about the day-to-day -day parking needs of its, of its members are another, as well as the private operators who manage the other two-thirds of the parking. And, and we would propose that finding a balance between these partners, each with its own responsibility, could be a way forward with this. The downtown partnership has already done a lot of the work that's proposed in, in this graphic here. Um, from having done this study. We've met with a broad base of stakeholders, you know, cultural institutions, businesses, the real estate community, the other private operators, and have built a pretty strong consensus around these ideas. People feel like some of these things that we've found and that we've observed and suggested are solid ways forward, that these are the things we need to be addressing. So there is strong political support for this. 
Uh, it's been great working with the city staff on this, and we look forward to doing more of that to bring this into more of um, a plan and implementation steps. Um, but you know, all three of these agents are important parts of this process. So I will pause on that because I know that's a lot of information delivered really quickly. I also have some you know, comparable cases from, from other cities who have faced similar challenges we can talk about. But I do want to give you this opportunity to ask me questions, um, and we can go back into any of this as needed. Thank you. Well, we will ask questions, then we're going to see if the audience have any questions. Okay, so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, any questions from council? Uh, I, let me ask you, I saw the, the examples in Ann Arbor and everything else, and one of the things that you put on here is that it's uh, the city would set public pricing. Are you talking about uh, across the board, even with the, uh, the um, private uh, providers? It, it varies. Okay. Um, the way and I, I want to ask how that works because. Sure. Would you like, uh, Mr. Suarez, would you like me to go to that slide? Just answer this quick question, which sure. is, does, a does Ann Arbor uh, have an ordinance that sets pricing within the central business district or wherever they're talking about in their parking example and say that you cannot go below something or what is, well, how do they do it? Ann Arbor controls the city owned parking, city controls that parking and ordinance controls that much. They don't try to govern what anyone else can charge. Okay, that's what I wanted to find out because, you know, obviously uh, through ordinances we can offer incentives or disincentives in order to make sure that the private parking partners do become partners so that our pricing is, if not uniform, it's going to have for different uses, mm -hmm. as you've mentioned in here, and that we can have uh, an overall uh, process of showing where people can park and then have the downtown partnership in conjunction with Hart or with anyone else to provide mobility so that 12 minute walk can be a five minute ride uh, along you know, some of these places. Because if you've mentioned at the very beginning that there's enough parking, the problem is mobility, it isn't parking. And I think you mentioned that, uh, you touched on a little bit when you did it. And that's why when, I'm, when you're talking about set prices, obviously we set prices for our own uh, yes. garages. Are you opining based on this, uh, on this presentation that we have to have a better uh, median point for us, for our parking uh, facilities? Because you made that comment of covered parking is a, is $1.50, you know, uh, on-street parking is $1.60. I mean, it seems like a very small differential between the two. Is right. there some, is there, are you talking about more pricing changes or just smarter pricing uh, uh, options? I think, well, that's a good question. And I think yeah. the answer to that is both of those. Okay. Um, and that the second um, I'll, I'll talk about quickly is not something that I brought up explicitly in the presentation, <clears throat> but we do see opportunity. Um, I've mentioned monthly permits a lot and how sure. dominant they are. We do see opportunity in diversifying the way parking is sold to customers. So part of that is more products, but by doing that, you end up with more price points as well. Yeah. So to get to price, we think there's a, a sort of roundabout way. We're very emphatic that it's not just about raising price with this. It's, it's finding the sweet spots about how the market's demands are going to be met through parking. Yeah, and you know, one of the things, and I don't know if, if Ann Arbor or any other city does this, but I mean, we need to have a significant investment in uh, coming up with a parking app and a transit app that actually connects to each other so that you know what the value of your time and money is so that if I have to park at uh, the Royal lot, which is a, a city owned uh, surface lot, that I know what that cost and time is to me uh, in order to park there, but it's going to be less expensive. Right. You know, so I'm, I'm, cha I'm trading off and I, I don't think we do enough of that. And that, you know, we're, we're a remnant of our history. So we're trying to, we're trying to, dig out of it, so to speak. So, <laughs> Well, the, the good news with that, Mr. Suarez, is that all cities are learning this to some degree. Everyone's kind of inventing their own playbook for right. how to deal with their issues. So Tampa's far from alone in that. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank You're you. welcome. Okay. Anyone in the audience wish to speak on item number six? Item number six. All right, sir. Um, uh, close it out. Well, thank you again, members of the council. It's been good to present this in front of you. We look forward to continuing to work with staff. Okay. I got one question. When are you moving back to Tampa? <laughs> Might be pretty soon, actually. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, we go to item number seven.
Good morning, Council. Kristen Mora, Legal Department. I have a quick handout for you here. Just pass these up. Good morning. So I am going to go through this, but I am going to give you a little bit of information today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the rewrite and what it encompasses. Um, I'll go through it fairly quickly, but um, it is a lot of information. So you all should have received a pack from me yesterday. It's included in there as well. Um, so I'll move through those fairly quickly. Um, so the comprehensive rewrite of Chapter 13, the Tree and Landscaping Code, encompasses a lot of changes. It's intended to streamline and make it a more user-friendly code. Um, so one of the first things that we have done that is a significant change from our current code structure is to move away from grand trees as a point system. As some of you may know, currently points are assigned for the size of the trunk, for the size of the limbs, the size of the canopy, and an overall point, uh, set of points is assigned to a given tree. And then if those points meet the minimum number of points, it's considered a grand. Well, over the years, that's been a difficult system um, to work through. But what we have found consistently is that usually if a tree is 32 inches or greater, it's going to meet the minimum number of points. So in an effort for simplicity, we are moving to 32 inch DBH um, trees will be grand trees, 32 inches and up. And that will make it a little bit simpler, a little bit more user friendly for people to see and immediately be able to assess whether or not a tree is grand. Um, in addition, we are making uh, another change one of the discussions that came up, uh, especially in conjunction with reducing setbacks in order to save trees, was to add another type of tree, and that's specimen trees. So specimen trees are the same species that would be a grand tree. Um, but specimen trees are a little bit smaller. They would still be considered a protected tree for purposes of removal and other types of treatment, um, with the one exception that I'll go over with you. Um, so why the 24 inches? I just want to go through this a little bit briefly. In the City of Tampa's Urban Ecological Analysis 2006-2007, um, there's sort of two breakpoints that you will see here in terms of carbon sequestration. So we're looking at the benefits that these trees give us, um, carbon sequestration being one of those, uh, stormwater retention, shade. Um, there's a lot of benefits that these trees give us, especially these very large trees. And you'll note here that right around 24 inches, there is a break point for carbon storage, where there's a significant greater carbon storage in these 24 inch and larger trees. You also see another interesting uh, jump here right at around the 32 inch mark, which is what we're considering grand trees. So we're targeting and protecting those trees that are giving us the absolute most benefits to our system. Similarly, in the city of Tampa's tree canopy and urban forest analysis from 2000. 16 that you heard presented in April, you see again, similarly, there's, there's some sort of break points happening here around the 24 inch as well as the, the 32 inch. It, these are the very largest trees in the city. Um, you get into very small numbers in terms of how many trees we have of these sizes once you get into these large size trees. So these are not a typical tree. This is going to be an atypical tree that you'll be running into. So we have added the concept um, of the specimen tree to this. And the first time that this comes up as an issue is the question of pruning. So as you know, um, and I also have in your packet uh, a general timeline and list of key dates for the rewrite. Um, and as you directed at the last time, we have met significantly and extensively with uh, the interested parties on this. We formed a working group and met every Friday. Um, I think some of you saw us in December for our first one. Uh, we camped out down there in the mascot room. Uh, so <laughs> we, we've been meeting consistently. We also had two large public meetings with um, a fairly good turnout uh, where we got a lot of information to the public and a lot of good feedback. But there are three policy decisions that we have not been able to come to any consensus on. Um, so I have those here for you and hopefully an easy to read format today. And the first one of those is the pruning work. Um, so the Builders Association has suggested that if you have a four inch or greater limb, these are gonna be the large limbs on a tree, 
um, that for grand trees, whether they're on private or public property, that, um, that should require a permit for pruning. Um, and also for protected trees, if they have a four inch limb over right of way, uh, because there you have a public safety health, you know, if there's a tree limb extending over a right of way, you wanna make sure that people are doing those uh, types of trimmings correctly. So the Builders Association, the building industry in general, that is their suggestion. Um, the tree advocacy groups that we worked with, this was a couple different neighborhood associations as well as the Tree Something Say Something uh, that you all are familiar with and have been very involved in the last year. Uh, they also had a recommendation, they said grand and specimen trees, because again, you have these larger trees. Uh, and the concern with requiring a permit comes out of, you don't want someone pruning these trees improperly and accidentally killing them. So by telling people, come in, get a permit, make sure you have someone who is qualified to be doing this pruning work. It's not a you know, guy with a chainsaw that doesn't know what he's doing. Um, the idea for having them do a permit is to have them come in and make sure that they're getting it done by someone who's qualified and is gonna do it correctly and not damage the tree and not get them in trouble with code enforcement. Um, we also have a staff recommendation. In the current code, any trimming of a limb of a grand tree requires a permit. And for the reasons I just gave you, staff would really like to see that. All the city's arborists have a serious concern that if you remove that requirement to have a permit for any work on a grand tree, that you are going to have people that will hire the wrong person and accidentally damage this tree significantly. So that is the staff recommendation, um, and that is the potential changes that you could select for pruning work. Um, so, and just to go over it quickly, current code, Current code is the grand tree limbs of any size um, and protected tree limbs greater than or equal to four inches over right away. That's current code. And is there a question on that? that a question to uh, council. Well, on number one. Yes. Couldn't you just split the baby at 16 feet? So we're required to have a scientific basis for any number that we select. Um, the concern with just selecting something in the middle um, is that there would not be a scientific or mathematical basis for that. Well, there must be a scientific or mathematical basis for the, for the 12 and the 20. Yes. So theoretically, we yes. could, we could <laughs> use the same, we could, we, could, we could come up with the same basis, I would think, to, to support the 16, just a suggestion. There, there may be a 15, and I would have to defer to Kathy back and have her come up and, and okay. speak on that, but there may be a 15, um, that would be a natural break point as well. Um, so we can, uh, we can discuss that also. Why not have Ms. Beck come up now and answer that so we can- we Certainly. Can, we'll know. Good morning, Council. Kathy Beck, Natural Resources Coordinator. The 15 feet was um, uh, distance that was decided for grand trees in uh, protecting what may be a structural root zone. So, and it's pretty much industry standards that that's the distance where the structural roots to keep the tree upright. All right, so we just all that one feet. Or fifth or we could just go to 15. We could go to, no, but we could, we, 15 would be a defensible number that would meet in between and it's with the, the current, recommendations. Yes, and it's the yeah. current no, way we're enforcing 16. it. Yes. Right, no, right now we're saying 15. No, but she's saying the standard is 15. Yeah. Right. Is the way we currently enforce right. it, yes. We can support, we can support that. So instead of changing the protective root zone, we would leave it at 15 feet, I guess, is what, is right. that what, yeah. yes. I think what I'm, what I'm hearing um, is that you could just set it at a flat 15 feet instead of stating protective root zone. Um, and then the 15 feet would be, and, and keeping in mind that there might still be situations where the structure is more than 15 feet, but still would impact the tree in such a way that it might still need to be removed, but for purpose of tree removal zone removals, if it was within 15 feet, then it would allow the automatic removal. Okay. If that's any, helpful. Any other questions? Uh, all right. Okay. okay. All right. <clears throat> Do 
Do we need a motion for this? Make a note for myself. I, I don't know. Yeah, let's wait till the approval here because we're going to have a lot, I think. I don't, maybe we will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so continuing on with some of the changes that we have in the rewrite. Um, so as you may know, today we determine mitigation is inch by inch. Now you have already adopted a change to canopy mitigation in the, I'll call it for short terminology, the interim ordinance uh, that you passed on November 15th and is set to go in effect on April 15th of this year. Um, so, but just going over it very quickly, um, we've changed from this inch to inch to replacing canopy for canopy. And what that does is that if you have a very large tree with an excellent canopy that is making a huge contribution to the city and you're removing that tree, you're going to need to replace that tree's function. And there is a five-year parity set in this. We're assuming a growth rate for the trees that are planted back and then you get, um, you know, over the next five years, what those trees would have grown into, uh, assuming they all are survive. Um, so we, we do have that parity put, uh, put into the calculations, but the idea is to be replacing the canopy. So on the other hand, if you have a tree that has a very diminished canopy um, and it's not a very healthy tree and is really not contributing all the things that we're looking for in a quality tree, you don't have to do as much replacement. Um, so you have the ability to actually be replacing the function of these trees and their benefit to the city as opposed to replacing the timber of the tree. And just for some quick examples, and these were prepared by um, Richard Pederica with Dark Moss. We greatly appreciate his help through this process. Um, he has prepared for us some examples of how these differ. So this is a live oak that has grown in an open space. It doesn't have any buildings um, or other things encroaching on it. It's an excellent tree. It's doing a lot of work. It's um, sequestering a lot of carbon. It's soaking up a lot of storm water. Its leaf area is catching water as well and helping with runoff. Um, this tree is doing a lot of work for our, uh, for our city. Under our current code, um, based on the estimations and calculations he has done, this is a live oak, which is a um, quality species. You get reductions based on the desirability of the species. So for example, um, a less desirable tree, you would have to do less mitigation. A more desirable tree, you have to do um, the full mitigation for. Um, so doing the calculations under our current code, uh, replacing inch for inch on trunk, it would only uh, require about 33 trees. But under the new code, this would be 51 trees. So significantly more trees, um, but this is a very, very quality tree, and it's probably kind of the exception. On the other hand, if you're replacing a tree that uh, has, has had a rough life, <laughs> this, this tree's um, not doing as much work as the other tree. Uh, it, it's got a tough time. It's probably not in the right place because it's been pruned very extensively. Um, under our current code, we ignore the fact that this tree is not a healthy tree. It's not doing well. Um, we ignore that, um, that it's not in the right place and we require 28 trees of replacement. <coughs> but in the new code, this would require just 18 trees. Um, for replacement. So we're, we're recognizing what the trees are actually giving to the city and trying to require replacement on that basis. So that is a significant change. One of the other significant changes we have is under our current code, um, if you take out a bunch of palms, you have to replace them back with some, uh, a percentage of shade trees. I believe it's 60% shade trees. Um, if you take out a live oak, you can replace that back at least in part with palms. It doesn't make a great deal of sense. Um, so what we have changed under this code is we have type for type replacement. If you're re removing ornamental trees, you're going to be putting back ornamental trees. If you're removing shade trees, you're going to be putting back shade trees. Um, so that's a good change. One of the other changes and something that's been asked for uh, quite a bit is a change to camphor trees and how we treat those. So a camphor tree is listed as an invasive species, and a camphor is an invasive species within 15 feet or within 50 feet of an environmental area. 
So if you have a wetland system and you have a camphor that's encroaching on that area, that can be easily become a very invasive species, choke out our more beneficial species, um, and be a problem. But a camphor in a non-environmental, non-environmentally sensitive area has a lot of benefits. Um, and there's a lot of campers in the city that are in excellent health and do a lot of good work because they are not in an environmentally sensitive area. So we've changed the code to say, you can always remove a camphor tree. You don't have to go through the grand tree removal process. Even if it would qualify, if it's 32 inches or greater, you don't have to go through the grand tree removal process in order to take out a camphor. You can just remove them. Now you have to mitigate for them, but you can just remove them. If they are near an environmentally sensitive area, you must remove them and mitigate for them. But we're trying to make sure that they are not in places where they become invasive, but where they are providing benefits to the city, um, you can keep them and get credit for them. So this last one um, on this page is a big point, um, and it's something I think everyone was very pleased with. Uh, so currently under the code, if you remove trees, you have to plant the trees back on your property or on some other property within the overall project um, or in the right of way, which as we know is always a perfect place to put trees. We have changed that. <laughs> you can now plant trees on private property um, within the planning district, so people will have an opportunity to say to developers, um, I know that some of the neighborhood associations have looked at putting up websites with people that are interested in receiving trees, and builders will be able to plant trees on private property and receive mitigation credit for them. So you get the trees right back into the community as quickly as possible. So that's a really positive change. We've also up the requirement um, of 50% native for 60% native. All mitigation trees are now protected, which is a huge um, benefit. Currently, if someone plants back the mitigation trees, the homeowner could come out and remove those. That won't be the case anymore. Um, they will be a protected tree, and they'll need to deal with removal of that tree um, if they're going to remove that mit mitigation tree. Um, tree surveys. So currently we receive a lot of very bad tree surveys in the, uh, in the city. We get a lot of trees that say, you know, it's a, uh, you know, it's a 30 or it's a uh, 28, what their favorite, if it's 28 inch, um, you know, laurel oak, you go out and it's a 40 inch live oak. We get a lot of instances of that in the city. So one of the things that we are now requiring is an arborist verification of what appears on that tree survey. And this is required for all tree removal applications. If you're going to try and remove a tree, we want to know what tree it is. But there is a clarification. The arborist that can do the verification can also be a city arborist. So if you apply for and have a city arborist come out, they can do the verification of that survey. So you're not required to hire an arborist, though you can certainly do that if that expedites the process for you. Um, some other clarifications, uh, currently hazardous trees are appealed to city council. You've never actually seen one of these, um, but we wanted to clarify that if you are going to appeal to city council, it has to be on the basis that you disagree with the hazardous determination. So we have added in that you are going to need an arborist report that disagrees with our city arborist in order to have something for city council to actually consider. Otherwise, you have a lot of testimony about, well, I don't want them to remove the tree, but you have our city arborist saying it's hazardous. We didn't want situations like that to occur, so they need to have an arborist report if they are going to come in on those issues. Moving on. All right, the tree removal zone. You all are familiar with this already. You've heard a bit about it. Um, so the tree removal zone is added for those lots that are 65 feet or less in width, uh, 100, and 30 feet or less in depth, and 6,500 square feet or less in size. And you then take the primary structure setbacks, go in an additional five feet for side yards and front yard, and an additional 10 feet for rear yard. That forms the tree removal zone. This is the area where um, on those lots, which we have termed TRZ eligible, um, those are those areas where you can consider a tree removal administratively, that's without the VRB process. Any lots that do not qualify for the tree removal zone, or if there's a tree on the lot that they're trying to remove that does not otherwise qualify for removal, 
it might not be in the removal zone or there may be other issues. It might be far enough from the structure to not fall within the TRZ removal. Um, those will all still go to the BRB. And this is, uh, this is grand tree removal um, for clarification. So anything um, that does not qualify tree removal zone for a non-hazardous grand tree would go to the BRB. And that's, with the exception of the TRZ, that's consistent with what happens today. Um, I'll mention on the policy issues, as you know, on January 17th, you moved um, and transmitted to the Planning Commission the automatic setback, setback reductions, um, which are 40% rear yard, uh, a design exception for 25% side yard, automatic one foot side yard, um, and a 10% building height um, increase, and a 25% front yard, regardless of whether or not, regardless of which planning district it's in. So those are the automatic reductions plus the one side yard um, design exception reduction. The, the tree advocates have suggested removing the requirement that the lots be TRZ eligible in order to utilize those automatic reductions. Um, that would require some restructuring of what we've done if you wanted to make that change to the ordinance um, because we have structured the exceptions for Parkland Estates and other things around, um, around those. Yeah, let me ask you about that because we've gotten some correspondence on that and I want to I, I want to be clear on that. Mm -hmm. It seems like on further research, the Parkland Estates setback requirements that, that are codified in their overlay district are correct. protected under state law. That's correct. Which trumps the city, correct? That's correct. So it's not, it, 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 there is no purpose to us exempt, specifically exempting them because they're already exempted, is that right? We don't have to specifically exempt them from the reductions because they are already exempted. What we also exempted them from, and it was tied in some respects to this, um, what we did exempt them from is the tree removal zone altogether. The concept behind that being that in Parkland Estates, they don't have the ability to shift to save trees, <coughs> so it shouldn't be an automatic okay. tree removal either. So so then my, my question is, what, it, Parkland then they're they're sort of taken care of by by the way this is done was our was our decision to limit the setback reductions to only TRZ eligible lots only to protect them or was that a policy we wanted to apply all over the city because what what I'm hearing is is that once they're out of the equation here perhaps the um, the setback re reduction options should apply to all lots. So as I understood it, um, that was a policy directive from city council that larger lots, lots larger than the TRZ lots had more opportunity for shifting and saving trees. That was not true of tree removal zone lots. Um, so, so therefore wouldn't need the setback reductions because they have more room to work in. Exactly. That was my understanding of your policy. Now you can change that policy, obviously, um, but that was my understanding of, of the directive on that. So that's really what's up to us then to decide is where do we want to define the limit on how who can move into the setback. Correct. And at what at what size of lot is it reasonable to, to not allow that anymore? Correct. Just to clear my mind up a little bit, what Mr. Cohen just said about the size of the lot, 15,000 square foot. What about if somebody wants to build a home larger than the normal home on that lot and it's applicable and it meets the guidelines of the setbacks? What happens then if the tree's in the way? So the way that the um, automatic setback reductions work is if there is a 24 inch or larger tree, so these would be the specimen trees, if there's a 24 inch or larger tree and they need to utilize that reduction in setbacks to save that tree, to preserve it and not remove it, um, then they are automatically allowed those reductions. Um, so that's the way it would work. They would have to do it in conjunction with uh, preserving a 24 inch or larger tree. So you can change a setback to protect the tree. Correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, um, that's a little bit of the information on that. Um, the 
the corollary to that is the reasonable reconfiguration. So if you are not doing a TRZ removal, if you're going to the Variance Review Board for a non-hazardous brand tree removal, um, currently there are 10 reasonable use criteria. But that's not the best method for determining when a tree can be removed because let's say it's a single family lot, you're building a single family home, that's sort of inherently a reasonable use for that property. So that's not really the best question that we should be asking. The question we should be asking is if, can you have that house and that tree? And that's the question we are trying to move into with the new code. So instead of having the 10 reasonable use criteria, we now have a structure of reasonable reconfiguration. These are the questions of can you shift the house into the setbacks? Um, can you move a room from one side of the house to the other? Can you mirror image the house and change its orientation? Um, you know, how can you shift that proposed structure around on that property and have the tree and the house? And that's the inquiry we're asking everyone to make. Um, if they come in for a tree removal, that is also an inquiry that our natural resources staff will be undertaking. And our natural resources staff undertakes a lot of that inquiry because there's also the question of how close can you get to the tree. And you can get within the tree's protective root zone by doing, in some instances, by doing air spading, seeing where the roots are, and doing a suspended floor over those section of the roots. Um, so that is something that has been done with a great deal of success in the city. A lot of houses have been allowed to be built with a suspended floor and save the tree. Um, so, but that is an on-site investigation and an individual question that has to be asked for each tree. And our natural resources staff does that today, but this codifies it and says that our natural resources staff will ask that question and make a written recommendation to the Variance Review Board that this is a, an instance where a tree might be savable or this is an instance where there's not a way to save this tree. Um, so that's the new requirement. Now, now we get into the, the meat of it. So how much do you have to shift that house in order to try to save that tree? And this is where the question comes in and this is where the policy decision becomes an issue. Um, what we have it set at in the draft of the code is that you have to utilize design exceptions. So it's either 10% or 25% in the front and rear, depending upon your planning district. Um, South Tampa allows 10%, university allows 25%, for example. Um, so you have to utilize one of those types of reductions. If shifting the house, that amount allows you to save the tree, then you have to utilize that design exception and try to save the tree that way. Um, it also allows a one foot side yard and a 10% building height increase. Um, so those are other design exceptions you can use to try to save the tree. Now what the tree advocate groups have suggested, and this is the policy question for you today, is whether you also have to use the new automatic reductions in yards that you transmitted on the 17th. So that would be, again, a 25% front yard regardless of planning district. Excuse me, it's been a long day. 40% uh, in the rear yard and up to 25% of the side yards. So the question before you is should you have to shift full 20 or shift the full 40% into the rear yard in order to try <coughs> to save a tree? The, uh, what the building industry is telling us is that is a huge shift, um, that that's not something that generally goes very well between neighbors um, and that that's something that should be determined on a case by case basis, whether there's additional reductions um, not that that should be something you're required to utilize in every instance to try to save a tree. The tree advocate groups have suggested that that will save more trees. So that is a policy, that is the other policy decision here before you today. And if you, you may want to hear from, uh, from everyone before you make that decision, but I'll just present that information to you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, anything further or? Uh, let me see. Oh, um, yes, very quickly, just a couple more points. Um, on that VRB removal, so you're doing this reasonable reconfiguration analysis, there's also an analysis that we're requiring that the VRB undertake, which is how much will it cost to try to save the tree? If you're using the alternate construction method, how much money is that going to cost? It could potentially be an expensive um, undertaking. And then they weigh that against the overall health and benefits of the tree. So is this an excellent tree? doing a lot of benefit for the city and it's a minimal cost for the, uh, for the you know, raised floor 
or is it a huge cost for the raised floor and this is not a very good tree that we necessarily need to save? So that's an inquiry that the um, variance review board would be making as well. And finally, for any accessory structures, because there are tree removal applications in conjunction with pools, um, other types of accessory structures, mother-in-law suites, um, there, there are various accessory structures where tree removal is requested. In those instances, we have asked the VRB to also look at within a quarter of a mile, is that an accessory structure you regularly see? Does everyone within this quarter mile area all have a pool of the same size such that it will be very odd for this lot to be left out and be the only person that doesn't have that size of a pool? Um, in those instances, they can consider that additional criteria um, to determine whether or not it is reasonable to remove the tree. That is a nutshell of the new code. Councilman Can I Collins. just ask a question? Um, what is it that you're asking us to do today? I mean, because we're, we're being presented with these questions and yes. some of them are not, they're not things I'm, I'm capable of making a decision off the fly without at least reading through and thinking about wh wh where are we supposed to go from here today? So um, the next step for this would be transmittal to the Planning Commission. Um, the policy decisions that you see on, on this page are ones that we would need a decision on in order for the Planning Commission to weigh in properly. Um, March 11th is the next possible Planning Commission meeting um, and they have to receive the transmittal from us 30 days in advance. Um, so you could potentially you know, put this off to maybe next week um, or something like that, but it will probably need to be a fairly quick decision. Um, I'm sorry, let me go to another exhibit very quickly to help illustrate this. In order to have this back in front of you before, um, as some people have said. We expire. <laughs> you expire. <laughs> 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 Uh, in order to have this back in front of you, you really need to make that March 11th uh, Planning Commission meeting. Now, there's also the April 15th um, pending date for ordinances. What we would suggest as a clean measure, um, if you want to try and get a decision on this, would be, because th this encompasses those interim changes and then builds a little bit more on them. Um, we would suggest the evening, March 14th, and then an April 4th um, second reading and adoption in order to get you in before that effective date for those other two ordinances. Um, so that is our suggestion. Um, I don't have the rest of your uh, agendas in front of you, but I think we probably have a city council next week at which I could do a staff report. Anything further from members of council? Okay, and thank you for that uh, very detailed presentation because I'm sure that that took a lot of work uh, to do so thank you very much so for that okay if any members of the public would like to speak for three minutes at a time if everyone would please stand up and line up against the wall if it is your intent to speak here today go ahead sir hang on I gotta get myself organized Gary Brown, uh, I've resided 491 Severn Avenue on Davis Island. <coughs> and I'm here to talk to you only about uh, the first policy decision, which is the reduction of the distance uh, in what you've already approved in Chapter 13. Two months ago, it was okay. Everybody was fine. Yes. Staff was okay. Now, all of a sudden, there's a problem. So. What I want to show you in this very simple sketch, this is a very typical average laurel oak tree, grand laurel oak tree, okay, that Mr. Pederica put together for us. So all I'm doing graphically for you in a very simple model is taking this same tree and I'm putting it <coughs> on a TRZ lot. This lot is 50 by 130. And if you look at the graphic, I'm showing you the crown spread of this 39-inch lower oak tree, and I'm showing its proximity to the home 12 feet away. 
which is what the tree advocates are asking. So before you split the baby, councilman, <laughs> please hear this out. For years, Natural Resources has been telling us large grand trees really need more room. They don't need to be impinged, you know, uh, built closer to. Yes, we can do it. Yes, we don't mind doing it. And yes, it will require a lot of cost to do it. And we've been able to work with Natural Resources on that. So the concept that everybody agreed to when we defined the area of the TRZ, which is the area in pink, was based on the 20-foot radius. So if you're going to move the goalposts now to 15, let's go back and talk about the TRZ. Maybe we don't decrease the setbacks more by 5 feet on the sides, 5 feet in the front, and 10 feet in the rear. If we had discussed that up front and everybody agreed staff wants it to be 15 feet, we would have a bigger TRZ area on small lots. So I don't care if it's 15, make the TRZ bigger. <coughs> or let's just leave it alone, let's give it a shot, let's try it for a couple of years and then come back and tweak the code. But don't just split the baby. May I just say, we're, we're, this is a, it's a complicated issue, and so when, when we talk through it, we have to be free to, to, to talk freely up here. Okay. No, I mean, I mean we really I, do. I, I'm, we're I'm trying to understand. Counsel, then, I, then I apologize. Yeah. But literally, both sides got together with staff and worked this out. There's no reason to change it. There is no reason to change it. We're not talking about that many lots. The, the whole small lot definition reduced the number of lots in the city to where everybody said, okay, let's try it. That's all we're asking. Thank you very much. All right, we're approaching uh, 12. How many? About 30. Yeah, 30 minutes. Uh, Second. No, I got a motion from Mr. Maniscalco, who says Mr. Miranda to extend the 30 more minutes. All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Okay. Next ma'am. My name is Sandra Friend Bates from 6807 uh, South uh, Elementa Street. And I would like to ask the council to please require Grand Oaks to be within 12 feet of the structure before automatic removal is permitted under the TRZ process. This is option B. Please make the new automatic setback reductions to save grand and specimen trees part of reasonable reconfiguration that must be considered by applicants and the VRB in lieu of grand tree removal in all planning districts and applicable to lots 15,000 by not just trans, uh, TRZ eligible lots, excuse me. To support economic development in Tampa, to ensure we've actually streamlined processes, to protect Tampa's tree canopy, and to educate the public on these sweeping changes, please give Natural Resources and Parks and Rec the funding and resources necessary to implement this tree code rewrite with these changes and forward it to the Planning Commission. And that is crucial. The funding is crucial. Thank you. Thank you. I have a letter that I transmitted via email to, to you yesterday afternoon, providing a, a copy of it. My name is Mary Lou Bailey. And as you know, I've been before you for over two years representing Hyde Park on this tree issue. And then I joined forces with the tree advocates and collaborated with the builders and more lately intensively with the staff. So we've been around and around and around. I think we're about ready to go, guys. <laughs> I support um, transmitting this version to the Planning Commission with one adjustment. I know there are several policy issues and people have a lot of opinions about them. The one that I think is most important is that middle issue in that the administrative approval for automatic reduction of setbacks for grand and almost grand trees should be applicable to all lots. I think it was a misunderstanding and in haste that the, uh, about the Parkland situation that we limited that 
to just the TRZ lots. And upon further research, as Mr. Cohen has said, we don't need to do that. And in fact, it endangers trees unnecessarily in other parts of the city for protection that Parkland Estates already enjoys under the state rules. So I want just that one thing adjusted and then I am ready to go. Um, I think that this uh, overall does a lot to balance the um, development interests, the property rights interests, the benefits of trees. We've come a very long way and a number of us have put in a lot of hours and we'd like to get it going and get it done before you guys all turn over or go into different jobs or what have you. Now, whether or not the code has achieved simplification remains to be seen. Um, there are a lot of things in there that seem simpler. There are other things that seem more complicated. We're going to have to test this thing on the road. And so I strongly advise that in six months, we have a, a um, structured and public review of the impacts of this um, code revision. What's it done to the canopy? What's it done to the cost? Uh, what's it done to the average Joe citizen who wants to know what he, can do, he or she can do with their property? I also think that the council should strongly advocate for additional resources and natural resources. They need new, new peop additional people, the, new, the current people are fine, they need additional people and they need technology and tools. We've given them a lot of responsibility under this new code. There's no way they can implement it with the current resource load that they have. So as you start working on the budget, please keep that in mind. Thank you for your time and attention. I know this is a difficult subject. We're ready to go. Just adjust that one policy thing and get it over to Planning Commission. Let's get this done. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Chelsea Johnson, 3313 Home Court. Um, uh, as many of you know, I'm the founder of the inter-neighborhood group called Tree Something, Say Something. I know that you heard a lot of information today. Um, I wanted to follow up on Mary Lou's comment, which is that we really are very close. Um, and I also wanted to speak to Gary Brown's comment about the, some of the changes. Um, as you know, we have collaborated with the Tampa Bay Builders Association for the better part of this year. Um, the, the tree group, it was a fluid group of people, but um, we have a, um, we've had a really good team. We've had many wonderful working sessions. Um, in the process of that, we were able to get the city staff to give us their expertise. And many of these people, like Kathy Beck, have been doing this for much longer than any of us. Um, so we did have some new information, which we presented to the builders to, um, to see if we could negotiate on. We, we did offer the builders 15 feet. We are discussing that. Um, they were not um, willing to, to go with that number, which is why we've given it to you all as a policy decision. Um, I just also wanted to say a huge thank you to the city staff. Kristen Moore has put hours and hours into giving um, great presentations to the public. I attended both public sessions on Tuesday and Wednesday of last week. They were well attended. They were, uh, Kristen did a fantastic job sharing about the tree removal zone, which is a historic compromise between uh, tree advocates and the building community as Tampa goes through its growth spurt. Um, so I wanted to give a, um, a, a great thank you to her, um, as well as Kathy Beck and her expertise um, and the building community, and we appreciate the collaborative efforts. We hope that you will look over what um, this very helpful table that Kristen um, has put together and um, can make some informed decisions. And lastly, I want to thank you for your time and your patience. Um, going through this process. It's been a, it's been a lot of changes. Uh, overall, the tree advocates are comfortable with the code. The, uh, there are some wonderful additions, like being able to put trees on private property instead of the right-of-way, which will prevent some of the lifting up of sidewalks and uh, driveways, which you all have no doubt been hearing about, as well as the uh, damage to our water areas. So we appreciate all of your help and your collaboration. And um, lastly, I also would like to ask for more money for natural resources so that they can uh, continue with um, making Tampa a top tree city, which we were awarded this past year. Thank you. Hello, I'm Krista Metcalf, and I'm at 117 West North Street in Tampa. And I'm here today speaking on behalf of the Old Seminole Heights Neighborhood Association. So I'm speaking on their behalf today. Um, and I am speaking in favor of the new tree code in general. I also would like to say that we support the proposed changes by Tree Something, Say Something, and the Tree Advocates. 
We also propose that the neighborhood associations still be notified of all grand and specimen tree removals. <coughs> so we want to make sure that we're still getting the notifications that we got before. And finally, we would like to propose an idea, not for now, for the future, something to think about if some of you happen not to expire. We would like, we would like to propose an idea of a priceless tree, one that is too valuable to ever be cut down. We understand that the property owners deserve fair market value for their lots because it would be ridiculous to prevent somebody from being able to sell a lot if they're going into a nursing home and need to pay for that, right? Makes no sense. So we propose or suggest some sort of funding mechanism to reimburse them perhaps using the Landscape Area Trust Fund, which is section 16-46101 of the code, and turning these lots into pocket parks. And pocket parks you may be familiar with. I don't know if you've ever gone up to Cedar Key, but they have wonderful little pocket parks all over the city on the, on the um, bay. And they're wonderful places for the community to come and sit and relax and have a cup of tea. So, we just bring this up for future discussion, and we thank you very much for your time. Good morning. Um, my name's Yvonne Ferrelli. I live at 2504 West uh, Sims Boulevard, and I'm a Parkland Estates resident. I'm also the treasurer of Parkland Estates Civic Club, and I'm uh, before you today to uh, represent our interests. Um, first of all, I'd like to say uh, Kristen Moore has done an outstanding job for the city on this matter. Um, secondly, I would ask that you please fund natural resources uh, to uh, uh, take care of the jobs that we're, we're hoping to achieve uh, through the new ordinances. Um, I uh, ask that the reasonable reconfiguration for the re uh, variance review board apply to all lot sizes. And I also, in regards to Parkland Estates, we have our overlay district, with, which is unique uh, to the city of Tampa. Uh, I will let you know that I, we believe that the Parkland Estates residents um, put a lot of value in their um, setbacks. And we don't want to see our setbacks adjusted um, so much. Uh, we put a lot of value in that. We also put a lot of value in the trees. And in regards to some of these um, uh, considerations for outside buildings or uh, extra large homes in which uh, the cost of the building or the structure versus the value of the tree, that concerns me. I think that um, builders and homeowners should be uh, placing greater cost at their building their structure and saving the tree. For instance, uh, in, on my lot, um, John and Grace Sample built uh, an addition to my home, which I was grateful for. They're wonderful contractors. But we put a, a specific slab to save the root structure of a grand tree near the home. And we paid for it as homeowners. And that's what I'd like to see to protect the trees in our neighborhood for future buildings. Thank you. Good morning, Council. Ricky Pederica, 400 North Tampa Street, Suite 1040, with Dark Moss. As a tree professional and a designer, uh, I just want to offer my thoughts quickly to what I think are the, are the choices before you. I'd like for you to consider somewhere 12 or 15 on the TRZ removal. Um, I don't feel that the adjustments, the automatic setback adjustments should be required in review, so I'd like you to consider these two options. And I feel that minor pruning of a grand tree under four inches should be allowed without a permit, which would be these two. Thank you. Good morning, Council. I know it's been a long day. Um, Steve Michelini. I, th I think one of the issues that we're dealing with is that we've been working on this for over two years. 
and I have a stack of papers probably that high, as well as, as you, uh, with proposals and amendments and revisions, and uh, we're, we're getting to the point where we just need to move this forward. Um, we sat down and we agreed on various elements of this uh, of the uh, ordinances being presented to you at the 20 foot radius and uh, we'd respectfully request that that remain. But it, this is like a water balloon. It, when, there are so many elements that are interdependent upon other elements that when you start making changes, they affect other things within the code. Um, so I'd suggest you be very careful and, and <laughs> about which elements you, you, you move. Um, if you squeeze a, a water balloon, it, it only it gets bigger on one side, but the ones that you're squeezing get smaller. So it, it's it's a very difficult process. Uh, our attempt was to make it easier to understand and for an individual homeowner to be able to process an application. Uh, we we didn't achieve that. Uh, it, it is a very complicated process. We've added arborists. We've added. Uh, required site plans and a variety of other things that make it more difficult. But I think in an imperfect world, uh, we have an imperfect ordinance, but it's better than what we had. And um, in that respect, we'd ask that you move forward with it, uh, uh, applying the, the various setback uh, reductions that, that, you can, uh, that you can use should apply to all residential uh, zoning districts. I think that's a, a very wise decision because the, there are properties, regardless of their size, that this could affect. So I would respectfully request you move it forward and uh, consider the 20-foot radius. Uh, thank you. Next. <clears throat> Morning, Council. Jerry Frank, House with Dan, President. We are. We want to thank the staff and the, the tree committee and the activists on their work along with all the other information we've gotten. We'd like to uh, uh, stand behind option number B. Uh, we could change it to 15 feet. We'd like to uh, consider the fact that the neighborhoods need to be noticed. And I'm not sure that that got put back in there. But I want to make sure that the neighborhood presidents, of the neighborhood association gets noticed and the People around. I'd like to see that to be 500 feet instead of 25 or 250 feet, but that's something that we're not going to get done now. But it's possible that sometime down the down the way, some other council might make it because the the value of the big tree, the Grand Oak, is to houses within 500 feet of the tree itself. So we should let the other everybody else know about it too. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Council, uh, Joseph Citro, 4015 Bayshore Boulevard. First, the disclaimer. The viewpoints and opinions expressed by Joseph Citro are those of his own and do not necessarily reflect any board, committee, or commission that he may be associated with. First of all, I would like to thank... <laughs> First time I heard this <laughs> from the N1 Council. Uh, you, <laughs> you all understand where I'm going with that. Okay, I first would like to thank Ms. Mora, Ms. Beck, Ms. Little, all of city staff who has worked together with Ms. Johnson, Ms. Duncan, and the TBBA on this. Their uh, due diligence to this has provided a new proposed uh, tree ordinance. I'd like to put it this way. This is the most scientific ordinance and the most legal binding ordinance within the state of Florida and they have done a good job doing this. And when it comes down to bottom line, this will save more trees than what the ordinance we have now. I hope that you will give the consideration to this new ordinance that it deserves. I support it, and there are a lot of people in Tampa that support it also. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Copine. Okay, I wanna, I wanna know why when we decided to bring this forward, 20 feet was okay. Where did that come from? Where we, did that come from? Was, <laughs> was natural resources? I mean, apparently that was something that both uh, agreed on. So yes. I, I wanna know what changed between that and now. 
Uh, Councilwoman, you're correct. The, in the interim code, uh, it was 20 feet because that was the protective, it's not exactly 20 feet, it's protective root zone, which in general is about 20 feet okay. um, for grand trees. So uh, the 20 feet is in the interim code and that's what was agreed on before. There was, over the course of the working meeting, some discussion about whether there was a smaller area um, that would allow fewer trees to be removed through the tree removal zone. Um, in the case of a small house that you might not need to remove the tree, it, it was a discussion that took place over the course of the working group and came up as a potential policy decision. So it's presented to you today in, in that context, um, but you're correct, 20 feet is the protective root zone is what is in the um, current interim ordinances. Yes, Thank you. Can I another question? Um, on number three, I just want to ask Ms. Beck this, just because as we're thinking about this over the week, I think it would be a good day. On the grand tree limbs of the, the less than four inches, how dangerous is it to a grand tree to have those types of small limbs uh, pruned? It's not very dangerous to have small limbs pruned on a grand tree, um, but it's very difficult to enforce the four inches for us. Um, we're looking at large trees up in, you know, how do you tell what's a four inch limb and what's not a four inch limb? What we're trying to do is to monitor pruning of grand and specimen trees to make sure that they're pruned to the American National Standards Institute for pruning. Um, and that's basically what we're trying to do. Uh, the four inches is currently only in the public right of way where we manage the trees. Uh, but we currently require permits for pruning a grand tree regardless of the size of the limb to protect, to make sure that it's done to ANSI standards. This is never ending. Pardon me? No, I know. I mean, no, these are, this, this is why they're the tough questions. No, I'm not, I'm never <laughs> Ms. Morena. Uh, Ms. Beck. Yes, sir. In, in uh, training and, and certification for pruners, and uh, most of them, the print, you know, they go out prune trees or somebody calls them and they see somebody, how they find them, they see somebody cutting a tree and they go ask them, do you do that job? Oh yeah, I'm certified. The other know if they're certified or not. And, and a lot of them, they're Hispanics because they're working pruning trees. So do you have some type of plan or program how you're gonna reach out to these people and find them? First of all, you gotta find them, then you gotta put them in training, then you gotta certify them. So the process is gonna take how long? Uh, there's a couple things that we are doing to address exactly that, um, Councilman. So one of the things that we are working on, regardless of whether or not um, this new tree code, uh, we're, we're working on it now, uh, Ms. Speck is more to the point, uh, we're working on an educational program that will allow for a certification of people that have been trained by the city and have demonstrated back that they understand the ANSI pruning standards, they understand how to correctly prune trees. Um, so the city will then have a certification process and people will be able to quickly ascertain whether or not this person is actually, the city has blessed this person and said, yes, this person knows how to do it. So that's a program we're working on putting in place right away. One of the other things we've also plugged into the new proposed code um, is to have an affidavit where you have mm -hmm. a third party doing a pruning. Um, so if I come in and I say, you know, Bob's gonna trim the tree for me, well, does Bob know what he's doing? He needs to sign an affidavit saying he's going to prune prune according to ANSI standards. So it's another way, because currently if something's pruned improperly, it falls on the property owner. Right. Um, but where it's a third party, that's not really fair to them. So we're hoping these, this affidavit will help the city take enforcement against those that are doing the improper pruning, not necessarily the little old lady who had her tree pruned improperly. Why is it always a little old lady, not the little old man? It could be a little old man. <laughs> One of our uh, largest um, complaints through code enforcement is uh, improper pruning of trees, which leaves them dangerous, hazardous, and uh, subject to ultimate removal. And how do you certify the, the job, what's the permit cost, and what's the process? Okay, currently the pruning permit is $120, mm -hmm. which covers the cost of um, overhead, basically. We've done the fee analysis. So how it's $120 you apply, and now we're proposing that you sign an affidavit. So it, it happens right away. The approval will happen right away. Ms. Cooner? So I'd like to just make a suggestion to council, whatever everyone wants to do. But my thinking is we could bring this back next week and we could just vote on number one, two, and three, and whatever council's pleasure is it is, and off it goes. Okay, I'm gonna add to that. Mm. Uh, 
I'm looking at this and I said, okay, this is what we agreed on to be brought forth. I'm looking at it and I said, well, why don't we move on this and look at it in six months or a year, see how it's working. Well, I mean, this is what was agreed on. This is what everybody brought forth. And I'm, I'm thinking now there's, you know, I've been, in, I've been in retail my whole life. And once you make a deal and everybody was in, including natural resources, everybody was in on this. And I'm looking at it and I said, why don't we, I mean, it could be next week, but I doubt that there'll be, I'm just looking not at it later, you know, see how it works. Well, I, I agree with that. I just, the reason I'm asking for the week is because I, I got to figure, I want to figure out on one, two, and three what okay. was agreed to, I think it's what fair wasn't, enough. Yeah, uh, you I know, uh, but okay. then I think we should move it. I agree with you. Uh, uh, because it, it, it seems to me each time this comes back before us, uh, it gets delayed again because we, it, it keeps getting changed. Now, we need to make a decision when we're going to move forward or put this off to the next council. <laughs> Because this 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 is this don't make no sense at all. We have made we have made determination that bring staff bring this back to us. We all talked about the thirty first. We need to have this by the thirty first in order for it to be transmitted and all and all this stuff. Now we're here. We're going another week because what we got today. I I, I, I favor another week, but I tell you what. Uh, uh, um, I'm through <clears throat> with it after another week. You won't get my support. Of both of I'm going to walk out when you get ready to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, sir, Mr. Mr. Can, can I make a suggestion? And, and maybe Mr. Cohen will agree with this or maybe not. I don't know. I think that, you know, when you, you did the right thing in trying to split the baby, but you did it in the wrong way. And oh. what I mean by that is, is that I think that we had our options in front of us. And let's pick the options that we think we should go forward to based on what I have heard from the public, based on what I've heard from all the, all the folks that we have here, our staff, the way I look at it is that under option number one, number, option A, I think we keep that uh, in place. I think that because the splitting is, you know, it will have an effect on uh, the, uh, the TRZ line. I think on option, on uh, policy decision number two, we go with option B. Because uh, I think that that is a, a reasonable request, and then I think on the pruning work, I think we also go with option B. Now that's just my suggestion. If we can go forward with that or not, I know that we, regardless of what's going to happen, we're going to have someone that doesn't like what we just did. Some of the suggestions that were brought forward to us were go forward with it based on some of the re recommendations that we have, have a six-month look back, which I think is important. We can then, after we send this to the planning commission, and then comes back to us we can actually ask for a report six months later so that the new council will have it prepared and ready to go so that they get into the loop on this because I think our loop is already looped out, okay? I think we're at the end of our loop, you know, so to speak. You want so to put that in a form of motion? I, I will gladly put that in a form of motion unless... Well, you got a discussion? We're coming back, yes. Okay, Let, instead, of of, instead of me putting in a motion, she, yeah. she wants to have a discussion on something. I have no problem with that okay. either. I don't want I, to move on any of it. Okay. We'll just uh, none of it. So just, I w I'm going to vote no because yeah. I think come back next week and then, okay, here's the thing. If we move it to 15 feet, I think we need to, by the suggestion. That, that's not what my, my suggestion. TMZ, the, 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 the building. Um, yeah, my, my suggestion area. was not 15 feet. But. No, it's yeah, not 15 Yeah, it's feet. not 15 feet, no. I'm not making any changes. But I'm, okay. making, I'm selecting options, that's all. Right. Option, Mr. option. Just my feeling is this, Mr. Chairman. We, I thought that there was a compromise in most of the items. When I read this now, there's a compromise, but with differences. So the compromise is still there, but it's not united anymore. There's a difference. So I like to have my one week with, with brought up so I can read and understand and in my own mind just make up which is the best way to go and, and say within a year it sunsets until the, the new council figures and, out what they want to do. And Councilman Miranda, I mean, the idea is, is that I understand. we're instead of we're Let's look at the options that we have before us and just select the options right. as opposed to changing a, a, a part of it because, you know, obviously there are going to be disagreements and sometimes they can't get completely where they're at. I so understand. let's just select the option. That's I, all I, I'm suggesting. I, I understand that, Councilman Suarez, but I also understand that when both parties leave unhappy, we did one hell of a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. We were getting there. <laughs> all right, so, so uh, we have two things on the table. One, 
the, 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 the options? Are, are you going to delay that to year, next week? Everyone seems to be in agreement that we can wait a week. And that's yeah, okay. Let's make a motion for a staff report at 1030 next week, okay. and we will Second. make a decision on policy decisions one, two, and three, and then we can transfer. All right. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Will we carry is that a time certain? Or I just said 1030 a.m. 1030. I'm yeah. yeah. certain. Okay. If you get here at 12, that'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a motion from Ms. 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 Second. Cohen, second by Mr. Miranda. Any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, information and reports. Uh, Mr. Suarez. Uh, nothing, sir. I just hope that the Rams beat the hell out of the Patriots. I'm tired of seeing those sons of Rams out there. You and you know, as me. Me. listen, I want to point out to you, just like every other uh, underdog that's out there, I don't like to see when the favorite wins. I agree with you. <laughs> I can't. I can't add to that. So I'll go on. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Nothing. Mr. Moran. Oh, I, I do. You know, today we had a comprehensive uh, review of what's happening underground that nobody looks at. Mm -hmm. It is the most important thing of this city, and, and I think that although they didn't offer anything, I think we're going to bring it up in the next council meeting to, to see if we can, what we want there, and how we're going to fix it, and how you're going to pay for it. And again, here's you had different scenarios. They also had different scenarios. We had three scenarios here, and they gave us three scenarios. So I think in two weeks, I, I'd like to bring it up with the permission of the chair so we can discuss and see what we're going to do. You got a motion for Mr. Yes, Miranda, sir. seconded by Mr. Maniscalco. All in favor, motion to say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Mr. Villar? None, sir. All right. We stand adjourned at 501. I mean, move to receive five. Thank you. All right. Got a motion from uh, Mr. Maniscalco, seconded by Mr. Miranda. All in favor, say aye.